good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 20th meeting of 2017. We have apologies from Fulton McGregor. Agenda item number one is a declaration of interest and I welcome George Adam to the committee who is substituting for Fulton McGregor. Do you have any relevant uh, declarations of interest? No relevant declarations. Thank you. Agenda item number two, subordinate legislation, is consideration of an affirmative instrument on the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 Consequential and Transitional Provisions Regulations 2017 draft. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, David Dixon, Criminal Justice Delivery Unit, Kevin Gibson, Solicitor, Director of Legal Services uh, with the Scottish Government. I refer members to Paper 1, which is noted by the Clerk, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's timely that we are looking at these regulations today as Scotland's first trafficking and exploitation strategy was laid before Parliament this morning. Uh, the strategy has been the result of extensive... Uh, so you're taking the trafficking regulations first, or...? The other one. The other ones, OK. <laughs> My folder's back to front, so... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, I hope it helps if I can briefly explain the purpose and effect of this instrument. As you know, the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 introduces a number of reforms to our criminal justice system, including in respect of the procedure for cases being tried before a sheriff sitting with a jury. Uh, these provisions are being commenced and implemented in stages uh, between the, the end of May and the end of August this year. This instrument makes some minor and technical amendments to the provisions of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which cover sheriff and jury cases. These amendments reflect the fact that under the new system, the Crown will no longer indict accused persons to a first diet and a trial diet. Instead, the Crown will uh, indict the accused to a first diet only, and the Crown will appoint a trial when it is satisfied that the case has been prepared by both sides and will be ready to proceed to trial. The instrument will amend the 1995 Act by removing reference to the Crown fixing a trial diet, as this will no longer be the case. In addition, this instrument contains some traditional provisions to ensure that the new procedures will function properly in cases which are indicted under the old system, but which will still be live uh, when the new system is coming into force. This gives a very clear uh, brief overview of the regulations and their context, and I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. Do members have any questions for the Cabinet Secretary? Just a comment that um, the regulation does seem to, to pick up some of the, the points made in the Crown Procurator Fiscal um, Inquiry Report, and the committee is very encouraged with that. Um, with that, then we move to debate on the motion um, uh, at agenda item three. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if necessary. The motion is that... 05624 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 Consequential and Transitional Provisions Regulations 2017 be approved. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can you move the motion? Moved. Um, any comments from uh, members? No. Nope. The question is, therefore, that motion 05624 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah, thank you. That concludes the consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm uh, the outcome of the debate. As this has been a non-contentious issue, the members content to delegate authority to me as convener to, um, to clear the final draft report. Thank you. Right, um, I shall now suspend briefly for a change of officials.
Before his consideration of the Affirmative Instrument on Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015, Relevant Trafficking or Exploita Exploitation Offences and Relevant UK Orders Regulations 2017 Draft. Uh, I once again uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Anna Donald, Head of Victims and Witnesses Unit, Susan Young, Human Trafficking Policy Officer, and again, Kevin Gibson, Solicitor Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to Paper 2, which is a note by the Clerk, and Paper 3, which is a briefing from Police Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's timely that we're looking at these regulations today as Scotland's first trafficking and exploitation strategy was laid before Parliament this morning. Uh, this strategy has been the result of extensive partnership working and sets out actions to identify and support victims, identify and disrupt perpetrators, address broader conditions which foster trafficking and exploitation. The regulations before you today focus on disrupting the activities of perpetrators and their purpose is to ensure our legislative provision is as comprehensive as possible. The regulations relate to part four of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015, which introduces two new court orders, namely uh, Trafficking and Exploitation Prevention Orders, known as TIPOs, and Trafficking and Exploitation Risk Orders, known as TIROs. The committee will be aware that commencement regulations bringing part four into force have already been made, uh, commencing all provisions relevant to TIPOs by the 30th of June and all provisions relating to TIROs on the 31st of October. The regulations before the committee today make further provisions in relation to part four in anticipation of that commencement. Section 16.1 of the Act sets out a list of offences known as relevant trafficking and exploitation offences, upon which the operation of TIPOs and TIROs are based. Section 32 of the Act deals with enforcement of TIPOs and TIROs, providing that it is an offence if a person who is subject to such an order does something prohibited by it or fails to do anything required of them by it. Section 33 of the Act provides that ministers may specify that breaches of orders equivalent to TIPOs and TIROs, which may be made elsewhere in the UK, is an offence in Scotland under Section 32. At the time of introduction of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill, the final form and enforced date of most of these additional offences and orders was not known. Parliament, then passing the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act, ensured that there was a method for updating the relevant lists in order that our Act at Section 16 and Section 32 provided such provision. The regulations before you today, if approved, uh, will do that, adding offences created by trafficking legislation elsewhere in the UK to the list of relevant trafficking and exploitation offences set out in section 16.1 and specifying court orders created by that legislation, breaches of which in Scotland will become an offence. These UK offences and orders are equivalent to the offences and orders created by the Scottish Human Trafficking Act. The only exception to this is section 62 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 which makes it an offence to commit another offence with the intention of committing a trafficking offence. Uh, we seek to add this to the list of offences because criminal conduct motivated by an intention to commit a trafficking offence demonstrates a clear risk that an individual may engage in conduct relating to trafficking in the future. The practical effect of adding these offences and orders to those already listed will mean that Scotland is an increasingly hostile place for traffickers. People either convicted or at risk of committing offences elsewhere in the UK, which correspond to the offences listed in our Scottish Act, will, can be targeted. Further, traffickers who are subject to an order similar to our TIPO or TIRO imposed elsewhere in the UK, who breach that order in Scotland, will now be able to be prosecuted here for that. I strongly believe that the addition of equivalent offences and 
orders elsewhere in the UK. To the list in our act demonstrates our commitment that Scotland is and will remain a hostile environment to trafficking. And I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. Do members have any questions for the Cabinet Secretary, John Finney? Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> We're fully supportive of the, the provisions that's laid out here. Can I ask two questions? And I know we've had discussions about this previously, I think, at the committee here. And it's in relation to the TROs. This is an application by Police Scotland direct to the Sheriff. That's, one might expect that the, it would be the, the, the fiscal service that would make the approach to the Sheriff. In other words, uh, the, the police would report these circumstances and uh, a warrant would be craved in that way. Um, I'm conscious that it says that it doesn't require a conviction for the, the police to make that approach. And I'm just wondering about, I mean, clearly there are thresholds of, of evidence. Is this, um, we haven't enough to go ahead with a prosecution, so we'll just go for a tiro. What reassurance can you give around that? And can you say what the avenue of redress for anyone who's the subject of one of these would be? Is, is there a, an appeal system and who would that be too, please? So with the, uh, for the TROs, there's no requirement for a conviction, although uh, within the legislation, there is a, a, a range of requirements that have to be met, uh, and the court must give consideration to those um, when it receives uh, an application. Uh, the reason that the provision has been made uh, for chief constables to apply for this is on the basis that these are individuals who, at this particular point, may not have been referred to the Procurator Fiscal to the Crown Office uh, for a prosecution to be taken forward but there may be a course of conduct or activity that the police have concerns about uh, that may give some indication that this individual may be involved in uh, trafficking of individuals. And it gives them the opportunity to then make an application to the court. So there is uh, a need for the court to be satisfied that the, uh, that the adult whom uh, uh, the order is sought uh, against has acted in a way uh, which means that there is a risk that they would uh, commit a relevant offence uh, within the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act, and that must be considered by the court at the time. There's also uh, the opportunity for uh, individuals to then uh, uh, to take challenge that in court, so through the normal due process uh, in which that would uh, be taken forward. If a, a, a TRO is granted, uh, there is the opportunity for the individual accused to then uh, take that matter back to the court to have it reviewed. Uh, and there is, of course, for the Chief Constable to do that as well, if that's deemed necessary. The time frame for the way in which uh, a TRO applies is also different from that of a, a TIPO on the basis that no prosecution has been, or no conviction has been secured at that point. So there's a fixed period uh, of at least two years for a TRO, uh, whereas for a TIPO, it is a minimum period of five years. Uh, so the time frames are different, uh, but there is also a set out criteria that needs to be considered by the court in determining an application for a TRO. Would you anticipate that the Police Scotland would be liaison with the Crown regarding this? Because it may well be that there is an insufficient evidence for a prosecution, but this is appropriate. I'm just thinking of the process of the police dealing directly with the courts, bypassing Crown. That's, that would be of concern if that was to become a process that would... The likelihood <coughs> is that these are going to be individuals who will be on the police's radar and by the nature of the activity that they have probably been involved in, we'll, I would expect the prosecution services to be aware of them as well. Um, but it could be a set of circumstances that there's an insufficiency of evidence to justify um, a conviction at that particular point, but there are a range of activities that would uh, raise concerns uh, which they would believe could result in an offence being committed uh, and that a, a tira would be appropriate. So it provides them with that additional measure uh, to take action against an individual uh, who may be involved in activity that could lead to trafficking. And you'll know from your, your own experiences that trying to identify these individuals and the nature of the way in which they're operating can be very difficult and complex. Thank you very much. <clears throat> name, Thank you, Kavina. Uh, just following up um, John Finney's line of question, certainly that's what leapt out at me from the, the, the policy note that um, the oversight of this would, would need to be, um, I think, carefully managed. Is there, is there a process by which the, the government intends to, to look at the operation of, of TROs and, and whether um, uh, further clarification might be necessary around the criteria or, or, or the operation would be kept under, under review? 
So what we will do is that we will um, uh, look at how both the TROs and the TPOs are actually operating, and we'll uh, do that by liaising with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and also with Police Scotland uh, and the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service to um, evaluate how they're operating and whether they are uh, meeting the purpose for which they were intended um, and to look at whether there's any need for uh, uh, further alteration to the existing arrangements that we have in place for them uh, going forward. So we will certainly keep them under review. Would that review incorporate any um, evidence uh, or input from other bodies out with the court and procurator fiscal service? I'm thinking of Human Rights Commission or, or uh, bodies such as that, who, who I'm sure will be uh, keeping a weather eye on this over, over the coming years. Well, we're not planning any formal review process, um, uh, given that these, the regulations for the TPOs and TROs have already been introduced, uh, and uh, this is just now adding some relevant factors to it. Um, uh, so there's no plans for a, a formal review of su as such, but uh, clearly when you're introducing any new uh, provisions, orders particularly like this, you want to continue to evaluate how effective they're proving to be. So we'll certainly be doing that. Um, if there were any issues of concerns that were uh, being raised by the Scottish Human Rights Commission or anything like that, of course, would be considered. However, you may recall quite a lot of these issues were considered at the time when we were dealing with the Human Trafficking uh, Act before Parliament. Um, and at that time, they were viewed as being proportionate uh, and uh, reasonable. Uh, but uh, what we will also do, though, is we will also engage with organisations such as Migrant Help and Tara, who are involved in working in this particular field, um, around how not just the, the orders are operating, but how the legislation the whole is operating. And they've been absolutely key to the, the strategy which has been published today uh, to make sure we're making the country as hostile as we can for those that want to uh, peddle in the misery of human trafficking. Right. No further um, questions from members. We move to agenda item number five, subordinate legislation. The formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comment on it. The motion uh, will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if necessary. The motion is 05625 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015 relevant trafficking or exploitation offences and relevant UK Orders Regulations 2017 draft be approved. Um, Cabinet Secretary, could you move the motion? Moved. All right. Do members have anything further to contribute? Uh, in that case, I put the question that the motion 05625 in the name of Mike Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We all agreed. That concludes the consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft of the report? Yes. Thank you. I suspend briefly.
Agenda item six is our second evidence session on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paper six, uh, which paper five and six, which are spice briefing papers. And it's my pleasure to welcome Claire Connolly from the Faculty of Advocates, Gracia Robertson, member of the Criminal Law Committee of the Law Society of Scotland. Andrew Tico, lecturer in law, Glasgow Caledonian University, and Lindsay McPhee, past president of the Glasgow Bar Association. You're all very welcome, and can I thank you in particular for your written submissions, which are very helpful for the committee in scrutinising this bill. We now move to questions from members. Can I perhaps start with the Faculty of Adv Advocates submission and particularly where we talk about the criminalisation of behaviours such as those listed in section 23, which re requires to be contextualised in the legislation to achieve its aim. In particular, I, I wondered if you could tease out the distinction between common capital, violence and coercive control, something you said really needed to be looked at. Well, there's a substantial amount of international research on the issue of domestic abuse and over the years and in recent years an understanding has developed that distinguishes um, violence or conflict that would arise within a, a couple from domestic abuse. So common couple violence would be defined as um, individuals that would intermittently use um, violence, um, aggressive language, where a dispute arises between them, but it's not underpinned by an ongoing coercive control. And the distinction between these two things has, has been very much, uh, drawing out the distinction has been very much welcomed. Some people, unfortunately, might resolve um, interpersonal disputes using violence, but it is different from the underpinning coercive control that is really the main factor of domestic abuse. Because domestic abuse, as you, as you know, in the past, historically, people would talk about it as wife battering when it was originally spoken about in the 1970s. And gradually, as time has gone on, the understanding of, of what domestic abuse is or domestic violence, as it used to be called in Scotland, is much wider than physical violence being used by one partner against another. So the prevalent features would be that physical violence, there would be sexual violence, but they may be episodic. But the thing that underpins the relationship is a desire to control the other partner. And, and the coercive control becomes extremely important, particularly when we look at when victims of domestic abuse are the, at the highest risk of homicide, because that occurs at the point of either leaving the relationship or having left. So in terms of what, what our understanding was in the 1970s, that domestic violence was about violence between partners to resolve disputes between them, we now understand that coercive control is the thing, is the main feature of domestic abuse. And that's why, for example, homicide risk heightens when the relationship's brought to the end because the, the controlling partner cannot handle basically the fact that the relationship's been brought to an end. So our concern is that some of the behaviours that are listed um, could easily occur out with a relationship that's underpinned by coercive control. And without the context of coercive control being identified accurately, then it may become difficult to criminalise the behaviours that the bill seeks to criminalise. And it may also be difficult um, to maintain the public confidence in what the, the Parliament are trying to achieve, uh, I think. Is this linked then very much to um, a course of behaviour then? Well, the course of behaviour goes, certainly goes some way in identifying our concern, it certainly does, because the normal lens of the criminal law is a narrow lens, it's single incident focused, and the bill has gone some way to try and contextualise by saying it's a course of behaviour. I, I think that we very much realise that, that the, the point I have just made is really difficult to legislate on. So one of the things that we recommend in our latest response to you 
is that the bill to be successful must be accompanied by a public and professional education programme. And I think that that's, that's the best way to achieve um, a recognition of the distinction that I'm referring to. I, I personally don't think it's actually possible to legislate for that. In an ideal world, it'd be great if we could legislate for it. But practically speaking, I'm not sure that we can. Any other comments from other panel members? just seek to, on behalf of the Law Society, I agree with, with those comments, and I think that's mirrored to some extent in the response that you receive from the Law Society. Um, the, 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 the lack of clarity, I think, it's, it's mentioned, and it's, it's in part due to the, the points that uh, Claire has raised, that there is no distinction between uh, situations which ideally would not wish to be criminalised and situations where the criminal law should intervene, and that is the difficulty. And I think, as practising lawyers, we, we see difficulties every day regarding the issues of domestic abuse in the existing legislation that we have. I mean, I sit on a committee which is full of criminal practising lawyers. We're, we're in the courts day and daily. And you do see difficulties regarding legislation uh, seeking to protect uh, innocent individuals in a domestic setting. And there are difficulties being experienced even now with regard to witnesses not attending, witnesses perhaps attending court and not speaking to their original statement, which seems to support the allegation, um, breaches of special bail conditions. These are all situations that are, 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 there are difficulties in the, the current legislation. And some further investigation into that might shed some light on the whole dynamic of what is going on with regard to these cases and those other cases that Claire refers to, which are just um, people who resort to violent outbursts uh, because that's really the only way they can respond to these situations. That's that's the way they are. Um, so I certainly wouldn't disagree with anything Claire has said. Okay. Anyone else? No. Uh, I think one of the concerns that the GBA had uh, raised was that uh, if the new legislation, uh, as is proposed, is is passed, um, the very fact that you know, the prosecutors will then be faced with a new set of legislation. There, I think the GBA's experience is that there has been a tendency um, that when new legislation is introduced, understandably, the Crown are very uh, keen to utilise that legislation. And I think there's real difficulties for uh, prosecution of this type of offence and issues of proportionality and um, who is going to apply the, the reasonable person test. I, I think I noticed in one of the submissions you had from uh, the Chief of the Scottish Police Federation, I think perhaps in a later uh, evidence session you might explore that. I think he's expressed concerns about the police um, being in the position of being the, reason, the reasonable person. So I think we feel that there, uh, to echo what Grat says, saying um, there are a lot of issues and complications even in the current domestic abuse provisions, um, which I think could be closely looked at before we even tackle this very complicated area uh, of domestic abuse. Well, there's a lot raised in that uh, opening um, and these opening responses, but I think the, the course of contact and the time and, and what's included in that are things other members will want to, to tease out, which perhaps points more to, to identifying this as a very distinct, um, a very distinct offence. Um, Mary. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning. I, I, I wanted to pick up on the issue of reasonable behaviour, um, and I'm particularly looking, um, Mr Tickle, at, at your submission where you talk about um, the reasonable um, person test, um, and you say that it's not a helpful um, approach. Um, the bill must be able to discriminate between degrees of wrongful behaviour, not to distinguish wrongful behaviour from innocuous behaviour. I wonder if you could perhaps expand on those, um, those comments and give us a bit more detail around what you think should be in the bill to completely clarify this. Thank you very much for the question. I suppose at the risk of introducing the thick of it this early on, my surname mispronounced to Kel, um, so everyone gets to call me Tickle once. In terms of the bill, I think you have a difficult task in front of you in the sense that you're discriminating between a wide range of behaviour. The abusive behaviour provision is very broad, and I think it has to be in the sense that we're covering a range of types of behaviour which in one context will be innocuous and another will be profoundly problematic. Uh, the Crown, the government, have argued that there is a range of 
checks on that very broad definition of abusive behaviour, one of which is the reasonableness test, which is a defence, actually, is a defence that the accused person can offer. Uh, I'm not sure that defining criminal laws in terms of a defence primarily is particularly reassuring for the citizen, because then the burden, to some extent, of proving that falls upon them. As far as I'm concerned, I think the key thing is to ensure the thresholds for criminalisation are sufficiently high. In my submission, I direct you to the English legislation, which provides that the harm which is caused to the complainer um, would have to be of sufficient severity to have a significant impact on the day-to-day -day life. There is nothing like that in this bill, as presently before you, which would allow us to discriminate between more and less serious behaviour. As far as I'm concerned, I think that's the best way to ensure that this catches the right kind of cases and criminalises those, while ensuring that people who are behaving badly, who are behaving not very pleasantly towards their partners, are nonetheless outside the scope of the criminal law, where their bad behaviour isn't likely to cause significant harm to the complainer. That's the approach in England. I think it would be very sensible to have that approach in Scotland as well. But would the def definition of significant impact have to have to be detailed? Um, I mean, where would you start with significant impact and where would it end? Because I'm sure there would be many, many different views on what significant impact is. One can say the same thing about reasonableness as well. In the sense, would you have to define it exhaustively? Well, Section 76 of the Serious Crime Act in England doesn't do so. It simply says it has to be significant or substantial uh, harm or distress. In the sense, that is to some extent in the eye of the beholder, but this is a judgment about wrongfulness which is in context which you're going to have to look at a pattern of behavior and allow the judge in most cases in summary cases or a judge a jury case uh, to decide in those cases I, I don't think you can be exhaustively precise in this kind of legislation it's a powerful difficulty to define these things all you can do is ensure the decision maker has an eye to certain principles and I would suggest one of the principles which should be taken into account is the seriousness of the harm not whether it might give rise to distress that's the test which is currently in this legislation legislation. Distress. That seems to me a very, very low bar for criminalisation. But would, would the police be the, the first people that would have to make that judgment on significant impact? If the police are called to a property where something has taken place, will they have to make the initial assessment of whether or not significant impact ha has occurred? Yes, although equally under the current proposals they would have to decide whether the behaviour or course of behaviour alleged mm. to have taken place was likely to have one of the listed psychological effects on the complainer. That doesn't seem to me a particularly straightforward task um, either in this context. Mm. So I'm not sure that it makes a qualitatively a more difficult thing for police officers to do to make them focus on the seriousness of the harm as opposed to simply considering whether harm has arisen or not. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that? The only thing I would say is that the suggestion of the police entering into a scenario and having to respond to that is probably, I would imagine, less likely in this situation because the aim of this bill is purportedly to deal with ongoing issues over a period of time. It's supposed to be something not uh, like the single incident, the dramatic incident, the breach of the peace or the assault scenario, which... Um, obviously is more likely to be covered by police officers attending at a scene and having to assess a situation. I mean, one of the points we make is the difficulty of gathering evidence in relation to this. I would imagine it would be quite unusual for police to suddenly appear on the scene and be able to form a view regarding this kind of behaviour at that moment in time. Okay. So I think it's that presumably what's envisaged is a situation where there's been a, a continuous course of abusive behaviour and as Grat says I think there's real issues with trying to gather evidence because uh, people that have experienced this are perhaps the very people that are going to be extremely reluctant to come forward um, so I'm just wondering when will the trigger be is that when uh, another party reports it to the police but meanwhile the two parties are still living together. It's not like a situation now where there is a single episode, the police arrive, and if there's a sufficiency of evidence, they immediately detain or arrest the person, and then they're inevitably kept in custody overnight or over the weekend. But it's hard to envisage a situation um, where they're, they're going to be aware immediately that coercive control is ongoing. Um, so I suppose they'll be very difficult, and I think we described it marginal decisions for prosecutors, and there would need to be a, a lot of... Um, the very, I know they have very specialist training, but I think the GBA indicated we were quite concerned about you know, what the guidelines would be and perhaps would welcome um, some input from uh, those representing the accused as well, if that's, if that's feasible. Um, Thank you. 
Yes, certainly for me to... ...from people, it always seemed to be at the point when they left and it was reflecting back and there was then quite a substantial mm -hmm. body of evidence uh, built up over that time, but that seemed to be the, the trigger time. Um, Stuart, I'm just taking everybody in order that they've indicated. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm just going to develop this further and in particular pick up uh, uh, Mr Tickell's comments that he makes at paragraph four in his, his submission, uh, where he says, entering into any relationship inevitably restricts the freedom of action of both parties. And I think in a sense, for me, that goes to the heart of some of the decision-making, that is that surrender of power voluntary or involuntary? And is, is, is that really where you're trying to take us, Mr Tickell? And is that going to be, in your view, a sensible way for the, civil, the criminal justice system to be thinking about things? Uh, is it voluntary or involuntary? Because, of course, relationships are multifaceted, they change over time, they are different in different instances. Um, and the degree of surrender or trading in power and exchange for benefit will be quite different in every household in the country. Uh, is there, does that go to the heart of some of the difficulty? I think you could argue that it does. I mean, certainly it's worth reflecting on the fact that the definitions of abusive behaviours in the bill run from a spectrum. So there are some at the high end of the spectrum degrading behaviour, for example, which it's hard to see any healthy relationship participating in. And then there's the uh, possibly lower end of the spectrum monitoring type behaviours, making people to some extent dependent on you that I think even the Scottish Government recognises, potentially might capture types of behaviour which are perfectly commonplace, sometimes sometimes benign, sometimes not benign. So I, I don't, personally, I don't see any way of capturing the broad gamut of behaviour which this bill aspires to capture without having a very broad definition of what abusive behaviour might look like. My core submission is that in order to take that on to an appropriate level of criminalisation, we should have additional tests of sufficient uh, height, sufficient severity, and, I, and, and that would be my principal submission. I think unlike the Law Society, uh, given the range of behaviours which uh, domestic abuse uh, covers and coercive and controlling behaviours covers from doing and saying things to not doing things and not doing saying things. I, I, I don't see how you have a straightforward definition, a clear definition of abuse. So I think this committee really should think about the thresholds. Are they sufficiently high in the bill as it stands? I, I, I'd suggest they are not. Uh, but we come to the heart of it. Do we need a definition in the legislation or should we simply leave it to the courts? Now, I'm not sure anyone who's here in the room was, was here when we did uh, debate the issue around curtilage in land reform in 2002 or thereabouts, where ultimately we concluded after many months of deliberation that you couldn't define it. You had to let the courts look at the individual circumstances and specifics of a case. Are we back in that territory again? And that's not just simply directed at Mr Tickell, but to the other panel members. Necessarily are, in the sense I'm not suggesting by any manner of means that you try and exhaustively define what abusive behaviour is. It is worth stressing, though, that it is this Parliament's function, it's your democratic legitimacy to, to make the laws. The Procurator Fiscal isn't elected by anybody. I think it would be inappropriate to insist on a very broad definition of the crime, which gives substantial discretion to prosecutors it's an abrogation, I would suggest, of your functions. It also raises fundamental questions about European human rights compliance, that this bill as a whole is a significant intervention in the private life of citizens of this country. Under the European Convention on Human Rights, any intervention in people's private life has to be sufficiently clear, pursue a legitimate aim, and be proportionate. For many cases, that will not be a problem, but perhaps the named persons case in the UK Supreme Court should remind us of the importance of having laws that are sufficient clear such that the citizen um, can understand them. Sorry. Briefly, you said clear. Do you mean certain? I, I, I suppose Rather I'm a lawyer. I meant to quibble. I, what distinction do you see between the two? Well, clear is understandable, certain is delivering a certain legal outcome, and I think they're rather mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. And I see Claire Connolly, who might care to come in, is nodding at that distinction. <laughs> The term I would use would be legal certainty, yeah. and to be convention compliant, a law has to be that. Um, but not only for that reason. If the purpose, and the, the, you know, it's a big step, the Scottish Parliament has made 
huge inroads into improving our legal and also our social response to domestic abuse since it was created. The Protection from Abuse Act, I think, was one of the first pieces of parliament, um, parliamentary legislation passed in this building. If what we're trying to achieve is both protection and also to empower individuals to seek legal protection that they might not, um, was not previously available to them because of the, the limited um, domestic abuse behaviours that were covered by the pre-existing criminal law, then I think legal certainty is very important, um, both in terms of making law that is enforceable, that's convention compliant, but also empowering individuals and giving them the knowledge that perhaps the, the, the lifestyle they have led, the behaviours they have endured or suffered are, are not condoned by law. In fact, they're criminalised by law. Um, but it, it's an extremely difficult task you have before you, as I said you know, in my previous submission to you. Um, so by no means am I suggesting this is easy, um, but there has to be some guidance. I, I think just a, a term a general term being used without offering any definition or examples is problematic. But again, I would come back that for, for that really to, to achieve what I believe they aim to be, context is everything. So you used the word guidance. Did you use that in a specific legal sense to say that uh, they, 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 there should be extra legal writings that will inform the courts and the procurators fiscal when they're making their decisions? Or are you saying that it should all be incorporated into the primary legislation and supporting secondary? I, I don't think it probably can all be incorporated into the legislation, but I think that, um, I think as, as, as we've suggested in the Faculty of Advocates response, that an education campaign for the public, for frontline professionals, um, that are involved in enforcing this legislation, that individuals would have to have received some sort of training. Um, and, and it's not, this isn't an abstract, this is something that's well understood amongst particular agencies like Women's Aid, Women's Support Project. As I say, it's, it's internationally evidenced in research and domestic abuse. And I, I think that the, the legislation to be fully effective has to be backed up by an improved general understanding of the importance of, of context of behaviours. Sorry. sorry, if so, someone sorry, else wanted to comment you, there. Chairman, I wonder if I might come in there because I'd like to echo Claire's comments that I'm appearing daily in the domestic abuse court and the response from the Scottish Parliament in improving awareness and the dynamics or understanding the dynamics of domestic abuse and the provisions of vulnerable witnesses and assist and specialised courts and specialised training for sheriffs is all hugely welcome. And I wonder if you know, whether we're at the stage yet where we should be assessing, for example, the impact of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act, which has just been introduced, and really it's only in the last three to four weeks, maybe two to three weeks, that I've seen domestic aggravations appearing on the face of complaints. And one of the provisions in the, I'm just reading from the Act, is um, that the subsection applies where it's libelled in an indictment or specified in a complaint that an offence is aggravated by involving abuse of the partner or ex-partner. And the offence is so aggravated if the person intends to cause the partner or ex-partner to suffer physical or psychological harm, or in the case only of an offence committed against the partner or ex-partner, the person is reckless as to whether or not it does cause physical or psychological harm. So I think it, when we're talking about contextualisation of offences, there is provision at the moment, or has just been enacted, for the sheriffs to give cognizance to whether or not the motivation behind this contravention of Section 38 or the assault is, in fact, to perpetrate physical or psychological harm. Um, so, I, you know, I think there are many provisions at the moment which um, are working well, perhaps could be refined more. Um, before moving to yet another piece of legislation, which I think everybody agrees can be quite problematic. We'll, we'll cover the definition of, of psychological harm, but the coercive aspect you may assume is subsumed in that, but given the discussion we've had even this morning about coercion itself, I think perhaps that may be where the, the gap is, but um, I'll bring other members in now. Rona? Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Yes, I'd like to ask you about the impact of the bill in relation to children. 
and in particular the concerns that the Glasgow Bar and the Law Society have raised um, around uh, clarification and the statutory aggravation. Can you expand on that and what your, what your concerns are? If I could start off, I think from the, the, the Law Society's perspective, I think they, they, they just produced an example, and it's, it's this idea of the law being clear in its terms so that everyone can understand it, because it, it's a criminal law, and people shouldn't inadvertently contravene the criminal law. So it has to be quite clear what kind of criminality this bill is seeking to address and to attack and, and hopefully to, to form a solution to. Uh, and one of the examples that my committee came up with was the, 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 the reference to the fact that the acknowledgement that sometimes children can be used as a, a, a weapon by one or other party, uh, as a way of hurting, as a way of controlling someone else's behaviour, um, the use of the children. Now, children, above all, as, as eminently vulnerable people must be protected. There are other protective measures, there are other child welfare measures that can come into a scenario where children are being adversely affected by the behaviour of perhaps one of the partners and perhaps both of the partners. Both the partners could be at fault here. So there are protective measures and I think it should always be ensured that those are properly in place and working well to protect the children because that's the front line. That doesn't require a criminal standard of proof. That's a civil standard. People can become involved in helping children in that scenario, that domestic scenario, without worrying about whether it comes up to a required standard, which is quite high for criminal matters. But the definition in the Act is children as any, anyone under the age of 18. So the scenario, the, 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 we were just chatting about this in the committee and we were saying, well, what if the people, what if the couple are 17? What if those involved, what if their friends are 17? You, you could have a scenario where you have an aggravation because a couple's friends are in the house, that that aggravates it because a child is present during an altercation. And we, we assumed that that was not the aim of the, 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 the bill, it was to do with younger children. Um, but that's not expressed in the act. So at the bill, so you, you could have a scenario where you have a 17 year old coming in and I don't know, someone's not being given money to, to, to go out or to do anything at all, being on the periphery of that, but then being captured in this aggravation. So it was really the, the terms of that. Is that really what parliament was looking at? Were people being caught up by chance in this, you know, this aggravation of involving children? And I suppose as, as, as criminal lawyers, we know the shortcomings of the criminal justice system. It's quite a rigid system. You know, as I was saying to colleagues, it can go for the extremes of behaviour, but it's not good with the subtleties of, of behaviour. And that subtle behaviour can have a bad impact on children. But I think the civil remedies, the involvement of social work, involvement in the children's referral system, given that it doesn't require such a high standard of proof, I think that's probably the front-line front safeguard, I would say, for children. And my hope would be that that would always be a rigorous, well-resourced, well-trained uh, professionals dealing with that side of it so that they can enter into and protect children in that environment, even in a scenario where you may not be able to get a criminal conviction against anyone. Thank you. Anyone else like to comment? Um, I think the DBA addressed that also, mm -hmm. uh, the point that Grazia has mentioned that, uh, and I'm sure the, um, the chairman and, and members of the committee will have had submissions from the children's reporter, but uh, my understanding is that th there are fairly rigorous um, provisions at the moment, and as I've mentioned at section 67.2F under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act, that um, you know it can be a ground of referral without a criminal conviction. It only has to be established in the balance of probabilities that the, the child has been in a house in which domestic abuse has, has occurred. And I understand that there can be a, a situation, for example, where um, there has been a partner in one relationship and there has been recorded instance of uh, domestic abuse, not necessarily convictions, and then that partner leaves and forms a relationship with a new family. Um, the fact that there, there has been previous recorded instance will form an automatic ground of referral. So I think there are fairly you know, strong uh, provisions at the moment, although obviously the children's reporter may feel that there is a gap and, and, and their evidence to the committee might feel that um, it's not stringent enough. Um, I think it's, it's some of the children's organisations had said um, in their submissions that, you know, the, the term of the child being in the house 
wasn't strong enough. I mean, did, did the child have to be in the room or were they listening from the bedroom? Could they hear it? That kind of thing. Is that the sort of specific uh, clarification you would like to see? I think that, that you know, clarification is always welcome. Um, and it probably doesn't answer your question, but I think what we observed is that even without specific legislation, that's something that a prosecutor will always draw to the court's attention. Um, and the sheriff certainly will take very strict view of whether there were children in the house, whether or not they heard it, or um, you know, were even in the same room. The fact that an incident has occurred in the presence of a child, I would think it would always influence the sheriff's disposal. Thank you. And just to go, sorry to go back to, to your point about the age, the 17 year old. Would you advocate putting a, a, a limit on the age or, you know, a, an actual threshold? Well, I'm here on behalf of the Law Society uh -huh. in our discussions and we didn't really go into suggestions as to how the, the, the bill could be altered. We were really just looking at it from the view of perceived difficulties and problems and anomalies um, with regard to that. The, the other thing being that children being present in the house, there would presumably have to be some way of establishing that the perpetrator of the crime knew that the children were there. It would be, it would be a bit invidious to have an aggravation which conceivably could be an increased punishment for someone without them actually being aware of, of that scenario. So. Um, regard has to be had to how this would be presented in a court, criminal court setting in the course of a criminal trial, what evidence would be led to establish the aggravation. Um, and, and I suppose we were just taking the pragmatic view. The protection of children in that scenario is paramount. How best do you protect children, in our view, was the front line um, social work involvement, children's referral. Those are the ones that would really be best suited to deal with those scenarios rather than an aggravation in the form that's there. Okay, thank you. I think that there's substantial research that's shown that children who hear domestic abuse are often more adversely affected by it than children who see domestic abuse. Um, and what's evidenced is that, that those children who hear but don't see um, become much more distressed because they, ca they can't see how badly um, their parents being injured, etc. So I think to draw a distinction of being in the same room or not in the same room is not supported by the evidence of if, if we're trying to control the distress and the exposure of children. Thank you. Um, yeah, Rona actually touched on a couple of the questions that I was going to raise because I think she raises a couple of really important points there. So I know we've talked about in other legislation we've looked at the definition of a child and you know you've just answered that question there as well. Um, but it was also, I mean that's some of the evidence that I found really interesting was from Children First and the NSPCC where they talked about the aggravator going, it should go further uh, to recognise that we're, you know, where children are living in a domestic abuse situation per se, they're inevitably victims of that abuse, you know, regardless of whether they, they see it or they hear it, it is going to have an impact on them and they list all the, the studies that have taken place uh, to look at that as well. Um, I, so would that be recognised in the legislation, that wider impact that they're, they're talking about as well? As drafted, that the aggravation allows that to be taken account of. And it has to be the, the information required as to whether it's appropriate to have the aggravation issues like knowledge of the children being present, etc., are going to be before the person who's marking the papers and the person who's prosecuting the case. I think there's only so much provision, detailed provision for that aggravation that can be contained within the bill itself, the act itself. And as drafted, I think it allows a flexibility. Okay. And I totally agree with my colleagues in terms of the civil provisions that are there. But I would anticipate that those agencies that represented children would have been keen to have an aggravation attached to the criminal offence where children were present. And certainly the research results of the impact on children would support that because they are perhaps not direct but consistent secondary victims of domestic abuse when it's going on in a household. Okay, thank you. Um, the other area I would like to look at as well is the requirement to consider non-harassment orders and to get your views on that. Um, I know that that was uh, widely uh, agreed to in a, a lot of the submissions that, that we received. Um, 
but I think that, I mean, there was... Um, and it was just the fact that, I mean, so far, the evidence that we've seen, non-harassment orders, it seems that they're not issued all that frequently. And like I say, just to get your, your opinions on that, um, because a lot of people at the moment are having to resort to the civil process uh, to, you know, to get action in, in that way. First, um, I, when we evaluated, when I, I was an academic before I went back into practice um, and went to the bar, and with um, Kate Cavanagh and Jane Schooler, we evaluated the Protection from Abuse Scotland Act. And as part of that, we looked at access to and breach of civil protection orders. And it became quite clear that the provisions that existed at that time where that you had to, before a prosecutor could move to get a non-harassment order, they had to be able to show a course of conduct and behaviour. So the combination of the narrow lens of the criminal law would, was prosecuting one incident generally of domestic abuse. Therefore, there wasn't a course of conduct available and therefore the prosecutor couldn't move for a non-harassment order. When I later worked with Rhoda Grant and the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, we moved, removed the requirement, we suggested and, and you removed the requirement for that course of conduct. The, the reason why I believe that a non-harassment order being available and in fact actively um, a, a, a compulsory measure to make sentencers consider granting a non-harassment order is that women routinely cannot secure civil protection orders because of the contribution levels that are required under civil legal aid. So whilst a person who perpetrates domestic abuse and is charged and goes through court may more easily access legal aid, someone who's seeking protection may not. And given that and what we know about the, the trigger for increased violence and increased risk of homicide where a person has left a relationship or is trying to leave and is taking formal steps to seek protection, then it becomes extremely important that, the, that we join up our legal response to that in both criminalising behaviours but also at the same time offering the necessary protection. I mean, in that point um, as well, Claire and I have discussed the, the issue of non-harassment orders previously, and um, whilst it, clearly they can be a very effective measure, one of the issues that the Bar Association raised in the paper is how it's actually going to operate in practice. Um, at the moment, um, there can be many situations where people appear from custody, plead guilty immediately, and I think it's envisaged that as part of the uh, inquiry and investigation which the Crown and uh, assist have carried out that they will seek the views of the complainer on uh, whether or not they wish a non-harassment order but of course there can be a situation where you know th those views have been sought on the Friday night the accused appears from court on the Monday or appears from custody on the Monday pleads guilty and if the, the view at that point is yes a non-harassment order is welcome uh, should that be put in place immediately and um, without any further inquiry because I, I think often the views of the complainer are the most persuasive issue. And I th it's very problematic um, when a non-harassment order is made. I think I, um, we put in our uh, response at the moment, as far as you can see, there is no provision for the recipient of the non-harassment order to ask for a variation of it. We have encountered numerous situations where we're receiving letters from solicitors acting on behalf of um, the partner who's been the victim of domestic abuse saying that they wish the non-harassment order to be removed. But what happens, that there is no provision in the Criminal Procedure Act for, for them to make an application. It has to be done by either the prosecutor or the solicitor acting on behalf of the accused person. So I, obviously sheriffs will be um, very considered in their approach, but I, I just feel that there could be issues arising um, when there's not been sufficient time for um, the views of the complainer to be sought after a period of time. I mean, clearly, if there is a, a record of, of uh, domestic abuse and it's immediately apparent that one is appropriate or that the complainer is seeking one, um, quite often the point at which the application is made is after a criminal justice social work report has been prepared and the prosecutor and the sheriff have time, as does the accused, to reflect on 
whether or not it's appropriate, but I, I just worry that on every occasion, if a sheriff is going to be faced with the decision of should I make a non-harassment order, that they might be working on information that's um, very new uh, without the complainer even having a chance to consider whether or not this is something which he or she does want going forwards. Um, because, um, you know, once, once they're in place, they are obviously very strictly enforced. Um, but it is, it's more a practical application. But I think, and also Claire is right, that the, a domestic abuse interdict uh, can be uh, achieved under the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2011. Um, again, with there doesn't have to be a course of conduct. I think it's just w one incident is sufficient. But again, there are issues of funding uh, for that. Um. Um, just uh, in relation to some of the evidence, again, that we had from some of the children's charity, charities where they asked that they would welcome an amendment to the bill to include a mandatory duty on the court to consider whether to impose a non-harassment order that includes children in all cases where the statutory aggravation in relation to a child is applied. And to get your views on that, um, because in evidence we received from the NSPCC, they talk about, uh, they said they'd heard from the bill team there'd been at least one domestic abuse case in Scotland where a court had made a non-harassment order covering children, um, but that was subsequently overturned in a civil child uh, contact case. And they were of the view that it must be in the authority of the court within that legislative instrument to consider making a non-harassment order in respect of children and that when that order is made that that should be recognised by the civil courts too. My impression, and it's simply my personal impression, is that there's an issue with non-harassment orders when and when they're not, when they're granted, when they're not granted, how they're implemented, how they're enforced. And when I've spoken with agencies who were very keen to have this provision in the bill, their main complaint appeared to be there aren't enough orders being made and when they're made, they're not effective enough. And my initial view as a criminal lawyer is, well, can we look at what's happening at the moment? Is there an issue regarding these orders? Um, rather than seeking to just um, incorporate them in another act and perhaps more offences where this is coming to light. Um, I wonder if there's actually an underlying problem in how these orders are being implemented um, and, and people feel there aren't enough of them. And then when there are, they are there, they don't seem to find them effective. So if there's some sort of issue with the order itself, I don't know that this bill will necessarily assist matters. Anybody else like to comment that on that? Or? At all. No. I, I think the question of the effectiveness of civil protection orders is quite a complex one. Um, in terms of what do we mean by that? Do we mean they're effective in stopping an abuser being abusive? Or are they effective in empowering the recipient of the order? And again, there's quite substantial international research that shows the main benefit from civil protection orders is empowering the recipient. Because a, a, a formal external process has said this behaviour is wrong and it shouldn't happen again. And, and that, it, it, for women report, and it's predominantly women, um, are reporting that that's one of, one of the big benefits for them. Uh, ultimately, of course, if you have, and if we take the absolute extreme, the worst extreme situation, if you have an estranged partner um, who, as a result of having lost control, is going to carry out an act of homicide, a non-harassment order is not going to change that. Let's be honest, it's not going to change that extreme violence. So in terms of effectiveness, but the, the difficulty we found when we, when we spoke to, interviewed women, when they said, well, so I'd been to court and then I went to try and get a protection order, but I couldn't afford to pay my contribution to civil legal aid because now I'm bringing up the kids on my own and I'm, I have no financial support from my estranged partner. Situations like that are, are very difficult to be able to justify to someone as to why they can't get protection under the law. And I, I'm undoubtedly, there, there will be mixed views on how effective um, non-harassment orders, certainly what, what, what we were told when people did have them and they were breached, police officers, by some individuals that police officers would attend and say, well, you don't have corroboration um, for the event that breached the order. So a bit of misunderstanding. This was some time ago. Um, but again, I think if, if, if orders aren't being granted, if the perception is they're not being granted when they should be granted and they're not being responded to appropriately when they are breached, then that's about a training issue. 
rather than something that requires to be legislated. And in, in terms of your original question, if the, the aggravation in relation to the child is going to be there, then for the same reasons, as I've said, for, the, for whoever the, the victim of the domestic abuse is, then if children are going to be um, viewed and regarded as victims, then they should also be afforded the protection of a non-harassment order. Okay, thank you. More specifically, um, again, when we heard evidence from, um, from victims of um, coercive behaviour, then they, they more or less said non-harassment orders were pretty useless because if there were children involved, then there would be contact orders and that brought them inevitably in contact again with the abuser. So I think perhaps Ms Robertson is right. It's an issue that's very complex and um, it needs further investigation probably outside the, the bill to see just how these are operating in practice. Um, Liam. Good morning. Um, I follow up firstly on, on the issue of, of children. Colleagues have already covered probably the, 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 the principal issues in relation to the bill, but one concern that has been raised is that the bill doesn't take the opportunity uh, to acknowledge that um, within the wider context of violence in a domestic setting, um, it can be perpetrated by children in relation to parents or, or, or grandparents, as elder abuse probably generically called. Is there a, is there a justification, um, as far as you're concerned, for excluding that type of abuse in a domestic setting because it's different from um, the, the, the sort of abuse that we've been talking about this morning, would it would it complicate the the way in which the act would be would be implemented? Um, what would there is a distinction between domestic abuse amongst partners who are either in or have had um, an intimate relationship, and violence perpetrated by children or children against parents or elder abuse? It wouldn't necessarily be violence. I think, I think elder abuse presumably can cover controlling behaviour and, and, and all the rest of it in terms of serious abuse and, and distress that's referred to in relation to, to um, the, the, the abuse carried out between partners who have an, an intimate relationship. So I'm just wondering whether or not um, by, by not including um, that type of elder abuse in, in this Act, we're missing a trick or, or will it would that simply make the, the implementation of, of the provisions in this Act more difficult um, because that type of abuse is seen as very different from the, 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 the abuse between partners who have an intimate relationship? I understood that one of the reasons for the bill is that the, that the definition of the national definition of domestic abuse in Scotland includes a lot of behaviours that are not yet criminalised. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, um, as my mind is turning in terms of elder abuse, for example, uh, misusing money, etc., those are covered by the existing criminal law. So I, I think that they are two different issues. They're not the same issue. Um, so I, I don't know whether you can assist me in identifying specific behaviours that would arise in respect of elder abuse that aren't already covered by the criminal law in, in the same way that we have in respect of intimate relationships and domestic abuse? Yeah, primarily because the, the concern came through and the, the evidence that, that, that we received and, and, and amongst the, the, the broad consultation that's taken place on the provisions, I think the, the, the overwhelming majority supported a, a, a narrow focus on it and it may well be precisely for the reasons that, that you've suggested. But I think if we're, if we're opening up the scope of that in terms of controlling behaviour, I'm not sure why that would be covered in terms of, of elder abuse, but isn't in relation to the, 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 the provisions on abuse that currently exist um, between partners um, with an intimate relationship. Uh, example of this. I mean, imagine you had uh, perhaps maiden aunts. I used to have a couple of them that lived together. They had quite, quite a happy relationship together, but they would not be covered by this legislation if one of them was systematically coercing, controlling and otherwise abusing the other outside the scope of the criminal law. So that is what you're being asked to do in this legislation. Perhaps you have in your mind as well the English definition, which is uh, broader in general, covering family members, not just engaging children, but perhaps you know cousins who live with you. I suppose the fundamental question is this, if coercive and controlling abusive behaviour is worth criminalising in relationships of an intimate character, why is it not worth criminalising in other contexts as well? Uh, I think you had Scottish Government civil servants here who said that they felt it was appropriate that domestic abuse is a distinct category of wrong. Speaking purely personally, I'm, I'm not really sure why in the sense of if abuse is very serious but it happens between people who happen to live together 
but don't have a sexual or romantic relationship. I'm not sure why that should be categorically different and not criminalised uh, by the criminal law, whereas uh, abuse within a, a domestic partnership should be. Are there, are there examples at the moment where um, the nature of the relationship is, is impacting on the way in which courts are, are, are dealing with cases that come before them? If this assists at all, but the Law Society were um, considering the issue of why it was specifically in intimate partner relationships. And we came to the view that on a, a spirit of equality, um, the English uh, approach was really to be preferred to the Scottish approach of narrowing the focus. Because as, as Andrew has said, if the coercive and controlling behaviour is wrong and is to be criminalised, it should be criminalised equally in, in domestic settings where it appears, because presumably you have the same difficulties of gathering evidence when it's a, a close domestic relationship as you have in a, an intimate partnership or, or whatever. Um, and th th you know, there becomes a distinction between special pleading for special cases of people. And I know that some of the organisations feel that that is appropriate and that that is the way forward, that this is a particularly special case that requires its own tailored response. And, and I can understand their view on that, but they are obviously representing a particular group of people and that, that's their function. But if you're looking at a provision of the law, it, should it not equally apply to others who may suffer from the same type of behaviour and find themselves in a situation where evidence is difficult to gather in other circumstances? And the way that the English law is, is being implemented at the moment, does that allow, are we seeing courts um, approaching different instances in, in, in different ways? Are, are the issues around the thresholds that we were talking about earlier, have they been resolved in relation to the, to the laws that applies um, in, in England and Wales? Early to be able to, to right. you, you really need, this is one of the, 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 the our issues that we raised in our response is that if you have a number of legislative provisions coming in one after the other, and we had one last year in the uh, abusive behaviour bill, it's difficult when they're coming in one after the other to assess the efficacy of one individually as opposed to you know, all of them together, and, and that can be a difficulty. But just simply by getting cases through the court system, I think it would be a bit premature to, to form any view as to how the English uh, provision is working out. My, underst Sorry. Sorry. My understanding is that the English legislation came into force in December 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, and thus far, there isn't very granular data, as far as I'm aware, being reported. Um, though overall, looking across the whole of England, one of the comments which has been echoed in the media is that it's not, in fact, being used very much. And it is being used in cases which are often not just predicated on the evidence of the complainer, but where, for example, the police find in the complainer's car tracking devices, where there's very strong uh, corroborative evidence or communications data reflecting uh, regular contact between the alleged abuser and the complainer. In Scotland, of course, those issues of corroboration are even more important as a matter of law. We have to produce them for a prosecution to proceed. So those, I think, are the kind of cases which are being taken in England, though it is difficult at this stage for the reasons uh, that were just given to take a really systematic view of that. Just find... In the Act, which I think is Section 76, the mm -hmm. Serious Crime Act, extends to those who live together um, and are members of the, the same family. The final point I was going to take, again, was on, on definitions. Um, I, I think in relation to um, the bill implemented last year, Ms. McPhee, you were talking about um, references both to intent but also to recklessness. And I think in submissions from all of you, there's been some concern expressed around the definition of, of, of reckless behaviour. Is that something that remains, despite the fact that we have, now have legislation in place that... that, that appears to refer to, uh, to, to all sorts of instances is another example where it's too early to tell how that will be, um, that will be uh, viewed by the, the courts and implemented in practice or are there other particular concerns arising out of um, the, its use in relation to this, this draft bill? You said most of the submissions were concerned about the element of recklessness, and, and I'm just reading from the section 38. Um, it, the definition there is whether it's likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear and alarm, or the person is um, reckless as to whether it would suffer fear and uh, fear and alarm. But what 
uh, Section 38 and Section 39 deal with, obviously, is threatening and abusive behaviour and stalking. And I think the GB's particular concern had been in a situation where the Act is envisaging um, criminalising even omissions, um, which potentially you could be convicted of um, recklessly, recklessly, recklessly failing to do something. So I think it's, you know, it really encapsulates our concerns about the very broad nature of the, the types of behaviour which could be captured by the Act as defined, even reckless omissions, which... I mean, I know we focus on perhaps the most extreme minor examples, but that, that's the difficulty that the, you know, the umbrella of the Act would cover all of these situations. Whereby the, the, the bill might avoid um, opening up um, situations that could be viewed far too broadly? Or? Yes, I mean, I suppose the, the straight answer would be to make it that the offence would have to be committed intentionally rather than recklessly. Is that, a, is that a view that would be shared across the panel? Yes. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I think, again, to go back to the Section 76 offence, I think the mens rea component of that is that the accused knew or ought to have known. And it's maybe worth stressing that in Scots criminal law in general, mens rea is assessed objectively, which is to say that you don't try and make windows into men and women's souls, but you try and draw inferences about what they must have known based on their patterns of, of behaviour. Um, and it may be also worth stressing that recklessness is used in a range of different criminal offences. It's not a new term uh, used in the law, and it means something more than negligence. Generally, it's often described as a complete disregard for the circumstances um, and implications of, of what you're doing. In the sense, that perhaps suggests a higher threshold than perhaps just using the word recklessly might imply in the common language. Personally, uh, I don't see a particular problem with making this a crime both of intention and of potential recklessness. <laughs> That's just me. Okay. Okay. Uh, John Finney. Morning, panel. Um, Mr. Tickell, a, a question for yourself about your concerns about the term reasonable person. I know that's been touched on previously. I'm just trying to think of, of the existing arrangements whereby <laughs> two officers are sent to a, a dwelling house and they're making a judgment. Is that the judgment of reasonable people followed by the judgment of the, the officer at the custody making a reasonable judgment? Is, is that not an intrinsic part of the existing arrangements in any case? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's true. I think my particular complaint or concern about the legislation was about the use of reasonableness as a defence, in the sense that you could defend your behaviour if you could argue that it was reasonable. And the point I was trying to make was that some behaviour uh, might be unreasonable and yet not worth criminalising. Whereas reasonableness is also used in the earlier part of the bill to uh, determine whether the reasonable person would think the abusive behaviour was likely to cause the complainer harm. I think maybe you're asking about the first... Uh, sorry, the second of those two, whereas I was principally talking about the first in terms of the defence. And particularly for the, the, the court practitioners, um, the existing arrangements whereby, as we would understand, police officers may be called to, to premises and detain one or other party. And it's at some point in the process, there's a decision taking that this merits further inquiry, so people may be released. And this has given rise to a number of fairly high-profile historic abuse incidents where a pattern of behaviour, particularly violent behaviour by an offender over a, a number of years has resulted in quite salutary sentences. Is, would you an understanding if this progressed, um, amended or unamended, that that's the, the, the approach that would be taken in relation to coercive behaviour, which I hope we would all appreciate needs to be addressed? You know? The response by the Domestic Abuse Task Force in terms of, um, they have a joint protocol with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and that protocol determines that when um, officers attend an incident of domestic abuse that the investigative response is m more akin to a murder inquiry than the, the old response which was to walk the man round the block and then put him back into the house. Um, so now that there is an assumption made, for, for example, that there might not be anyone being able to speak to the incident. So there's a much more proactive gathering of evidence from neighbours, etc. Um, and also the, 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 the focus um, is very much on the safety of, of the this, this situation rather than allowing it to perpetuate um, in the same way. But of course, the difficulty we always have had in Scotland is the requirement for corroboration, and that can be very difficult because this is a classic offence that would be committed in private. 
And therefore, as you, as you know, and you're referring to that the, the, the t police tactic has also been to then go around and proactively investigate with former partners, whether they have been subjected to the same types of behaviours, which allows then um, a, a case to be brought, a prosecution to be brought that involves um, charges in respect of a number of complainers and that brings into play something called the Murov Doctrine which allows corroboration to be found from the separate individual complainers. Now that, is, um, it, that has been very successful in terms of a policing tactic however to suggest that it's um, popular amongst individuals that do criminal defence work would not be wholly accurate. If I can say that, no, no, but well, one I, would anticipate. I, I wasn't putting myself forward as a spokesperson for. Yeah, for any one would anticipate case. that 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 um, style of policing, that style of evidence gathering, would be replicated. Because of course, the police aren't going to be called. To, no one's going to phone up and say there's been a course of coercive behaviour. It's going to be an individual actor that's going to that's going to drive this. As regards to the resources that would need to underpin this, then clearly if there's that level of investigation that's going to be enhanced in relation to a range of domestic uh, abuse situations, then there will be significant implications. And, uh, significant implications already in how the, the current system is operating with the range of offences that we have at the moment. I mean, budgets are being curtailed, um, difficult decisions are being taken. Great steps have been made in specialist domestic abuse courts. Domestic abuse cases are given a priority in trial fixing so that they become they come more speedily into court so that witnesses aren't hanging around and waiting for ages. That puts them as a priority, but inevitably other cases then fall further down the, the line and some fall off the edge totally and are not prosecuted at all because there's now a, a, a view that certain offences need not be brought into the criminal courts, they can be dealt with elsewhere. Um, but there is a pressure building. There's a pressure building on the existing system. And that's not to say that this bill shouldn't go ahead, but it will inevitably put an additional pressure on a system which is uh, already suffering. But that's no reason not to do it. But it's something that I think everyone should recognise. Yes, indeed. And, 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 and the pressure to do detailed inquiry, of course, doesn't necessarily result in a... Uh, as the complainer would see it, um, a speedy response to their concerns. This bill envisages cases where the complainer, as we would call it, or the victim or the person who we believe has been subjected to this crime may not be giving evidence at all and may not support the charge because the bill does give the opportunity for cases to come into court where that person will not give evidence at all, that the evidence will be relied on from other parties or from other sources. And so that becomes even more difficult. What would you concern me about that, then, please? Well, the, the, the person... Well, you can, vis, you can envisage a situation where someone is convicted of a crime in a way to protect an individual from that crime, but that individual hasn't come to give evidence to support um, what is being said about that behaviour, and therefore you, you could envisage a situation um, where the, 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 the victim isn't, doesn't accept that she was the victim of the crime. She hasn't come to court and given evidence. Because it does say it doesn't have to rely on the evidence of the, the victim herself or himself. So it envisages scenarios that may not happen. I, I can't myself think of scenarios where you could gather that much qualitative evidence without the individual giving evidence herself of what she's experienced. But the bill does envisage a scenario where it's not essential to have the evidence from that person. Presumably that, that would be pivotal if, if the complainer was incapable of giving evidence for whatever reason, perhaps mental incapacity or, or illness or whatever. It would be important that the criminal law could intervene in these circumstances if there was a known pattern. It, yeah, well, yes, the, the bill presumably that, that's why that is there for situations where someone is so, perhaps so psychologically damaged they're not aware of, of how they are suffering or, or refuse to accept it because they consider it acceptable behaviour when by anybody's reckoning it's not. And it, and it is there. But again, when you look at how do you, how do you evidence that offence, that becomes even more problematic. It's probably worth stressing that it is much more likely that far more cases will arise where you have the evidence of a complainer, not that much more evidence than that, and the case never proceeds at all, however ghastly and 
uh, tyrannical their partner has, has been to them. So in that sense, I suppose it's always important with these criminal law interventions to remember we have to take corroboration into account. We have to take the wider evidential rules, which really do impose significant restrictions on the capacity of any criminal law to prosecute crimes that take place in private. We see that with rape conviction rates. We see that already with crimes of domestic violence, uh, already covered by uh, laws on assault, laws on threatening or abusive behaviour. And it's already been touched on by um, the opportunity for the civil law to provide protection there than if there's an insufficiency of evidence for criminal prosecution. I mean, clearly we've heard there's resource implications for that too in the access to criminal legal aid, which would need to be. Well, you'd have to use a number of the <coughs> civil orders which have already been referenced by a number of other members of the panel with the, with the problems already inherent in that, I think. These are likely to face you know, much more um, complicated investigation um, or investigative procedures. And also it strikes me that the defence are then similarly going to have to respond in kind and it makes the defence of these charges very difficult, time consuming and um, because the, the very definition of the offence of this course of coercive behaviour and the relevant effects making people dependent or subordinate, it, we could envisage a situation where a person accused of these um, will not be able to be readily advised while well, there are limits to the admissibility of the evidence that you're proposing that you wish me to lead because you would have to say that by the definition of the Act the accused person could rightly want to introduce a lot of evidence about the day-to-day -day activities in that person's relationship. So, you know, there are add-on effects for every aspect of the criminal justice system, including the defence. Okay. And if I could just add, I appreciate what Andrew says about corroboration, and I know it is some people's bet noirs, but remember that the whole criminal justice system, one of the main tenets is that you are convicted when the court is satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt, and it is a high standard, and it's inevitably a high standard in any good system of, of criminal justice, whether there is corroboration or, or an, another range of safeguards or protections. So you do obviously have that higher level uh, of proof that you have to surmount in a case, obviously in a, a civil case, it's, uh, it's a different yeah. situation. Okay, thank you very much. If I could perhaps um, <coughs> ask the panel about the Crown Procurator Fiscal's uh, submission, which said um, that the potential, this is, goes to the heart of the sufficiency and the cooperation aspect, the potential evidence may be available from a range of sources, including friends and family who may not have directly witnessed the behaviour of the accused, but may be well placed to give evidence of the relevant effects this has had on the victim. And again, if we go back, which was just such a, a good um, source of just trying to get our heads around to build the evidence that we had from victims, then there was the isolation, the cutting off from the family. Could you comment on, on how that would play out and would that perhaps um, alleviate some of your concerns? It, I, I would imagine it could alleviate some issues where you can have evidence from third parties, but it then also opens the door for third parties to bring their own prejudices and their own uh, complaints about third parties and their own perceptions of relationships which may not be accurate. That's why it would have to be put to test in a criminal court setting. Um, so I think there could be problems and benefits uh, in relying on third party evidence in these cases. Mr. Sorry. I, I think there's also issues around um, hearsay, obviously, in terms of the admission of hearsay. So primary hearsay is allowed in courts in that um, evidence of something being said by A to B, but the, that does not in itself speak to the truth of what's been said. So, so the, the issue around the admission of, of hearsay evidence, um, we do allow it to a certain extent, but, but not to speak to the truth of the matter. And if we're going to ask family members, for example, to give evidence about what they, they viewed, what they saw, in terms of not, not being direct eyewitnesses, but in terms of, for example, seeing a family member becoming more and more isolated, we're, da we're in danger of asking non-expert witnesses to express opinion in court, because we're asking family members to give a description of perhaps what their perception was, and then to express an opinion on what that amounts to. And with very strict rules, we don't let witnesses do that. Only experts can be um, witnesses of opinion that are allowed to express opinion. So 
that's going to be very, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Rough, you know, we were told, or she was told, so and so didn't welcome us, uh, didn't want you to visit. You know, if it was explicit, that wasn't an opinion. That would be a statement of fact that you know the person that was isolated. Would that then um, count as evidence, as opposed to? Well, I suppose it's still hearsay. You're it? absolutely correct. So someone saying, um, I, "I was told," or or she didn't want us to visit. But if the witness then goes further and says, and that happened because he told her we weren't allowed to visit, the second part's the opinion. So it, it's, um, it, it might be quite difficult to manage that in a court setting, but th that's the, the, the role of the judge is to do that and to control that the evidence rules are followed. Sure. But if reliance on that sort of evidence, and you can understand why it could become very important, um, it might be quite difficult for witnesses, civilian witnesses who aren't trained lawyers, to understand where the limits of their, their evidence should lie. Okay. Ben. Convener, but I was going to ask about recklessness, and sure. that point has already been covered. So thank oh, you're quite happy. Uh, Mary, and then Stuart. Um, convener, I wanted to briefly come back to the issue of um, children and the, the, the aggravator in, um, in Section 4. Um, Bernardo's and um, Children First have both raised concerns around the way um, it's described and discussed and drafted um, in the Bill. But I want to specifically focus not on the issue of a child witnessing or hearing abuse, but where that child is used in the commission of the offence particularly if it is a very young child that is used to, to perpetrate and continue psychological behaviour um, by an, an ex-partner um, to, to the parent of the child. Um, if, if a young child doesn't fully understand why they are being used, but they are perpetrating abuse, they are the victim, but they are also continuing um, abuse or being used to continue abuse. Should there be something else in the bill or are you content that there's enough in the bill to reflect that or is that issue captured somewhere else? Sorry, maybe if you could just clarify one point so I'm, I'm clear. Do, uh -huh. do you mean scenarios where, uh, for example, one partner poisons the outlook of the child in respect of the other partner, where they turn them against them, that kind of thing? Or no, no, no. Because no. um, that is criminal in some jurisdictions, interestingly. No. Um, where a child is used um, quite specifically to continue psychological abuse by behaviours and, and different ways that child is, is used. I suppose the bill focuses on the abusive behaviour of the accused person, uh -huh. and behaviour can be acts, omissions, things said, things mm -hmm. not said. So I suppose given that extremely broad definition of behaviour, which includes doing things and not doing things, I suppose it's hard to see why that wouldn't be covered already under the provisions. Okay. Okay. Stuart? Uh, I just wanted briefly to go back to where the victim is not the complainer. And just to test what that really means, because surely we have lots of examples of that already, where the victim lacks legal or practical capacity you know, as a child in other parts of the legal system. There's nothing particularly novel about the victim not being able to be a complainer, is there, that t informs this debate, is there? I think that the, the, the difficulty here is, depending on what incident or what actions or activities you're mm. seeking to show are criminal. You can have actions which of themselves would not necessarily be criminal, but in a particular context then would become criminal. And I would have thought that the, the, the evidence from that person would be very useful in seeking to prove that. I'm not saying it's impossible to prove it by other means, but it is a, it's an inherently difficult charge to prove. I mean, I think the responses from legal uh, contributors did indicate that. It will be difficult to get evidence to support the, this charge. It won't be impossible, but it will be difficult and it may be resource intensive and it may be lengthy um, with no guarantee of a conviction at the end of it because obviously there have to be high standards. It will be difficult, but not impossible. It's then an added difficulty if you're not having the one witness who in other domestic settings, the breach of the peace type charge or the assault charge, those cases in a domestic setting generally are heavily reliant on the evidence of the individual 
who has been subjected to that crime. So it's just a, an, an extra difficulty, as it were. It's not I, to say it's impossible to do, but it's just an extra difficulty in bringing this uh, type of charge because it's so wide-ranging and it incorporates both behaviour that isn't necessarily criminalised at the moment, but then it also incorporates behaviour which is already criminalised, threatening, intimidating behaviour, violent behaviour. That's all covered by existing uh, legislation or by existing laws. I, I, I suppose to... I suppose, too, that uh, th th there is a risk that if the victim is not prepared to be a complainer, they could end up as a, as a witness for the defence. Yes. And therefore, the prosecutor would have to consider that. Make, could inv inadvertently be making matters worse for that individual. Correct. Correct. Right. Mm. Sufficient, Camilla. Uh, could I just ask a, a little bit about the low bar issue which has been raised in, in various definitions. The first was the, the course of action, the definition and um, the faculty of advocates says um, avoids criminalisation of a single isolated incident um, but at least talks about it on two occasions. However, the Law Society points out there's no indication of what gap of time might be reasonable. So two incidents could conceivably happen in the same day? Um, uh, could you comment on that? Years apart. Or years apart, yes. Could you comment on that? You know, is that sir, insurmountable? How do, we, how do we address that low bar? I think the Law Society simply raised that because when we were discussing this in committee, we noticed that the policy memorandum was talking about a pernicious, sustained, ongoing course of conduct uh, that can be as damaging as any violent assaults because of its pernicious and continuing nature, mm -hmm. perhaps over a period, a long period of time, and how damaging that can be. But in trying to express that, we then have the Act which says a minimum of two occasions. And there seemed to be a bit of a contradiction there in what the initial aim was from this bill. And then to put in two occasions didn't seem to marry up with this low um, you know, a, a continual conduct of, a, 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 as, it, as it was called, a, a pernicious and systematic over a period of time of wearing down an individual, as it were. Yeah. Which yeah, we, I think, is what people wouldn't perhaps normally understand by this idea of co coercive and controlling. That terminology perhaps lends itself to that explanation that it's ongoing, perhaps not necessarily high level and dramatic on any one occasion, but it continues and becomes, I think, pernicious was the word that was used in the policy memorandum. Yeah. Any other way to address that? I mean, certainly, again, going back to the people that we took evidence from, it was over a number of years. And interestingly, it happened um, in every occasion, I think, once they were married, they might have been in a relationship before, and many years later, then this came into play. Uh, Mr. Tickell, I thought um, it would be interesting just to get your thoughts on distress, which I think you've got a particular concern about the very low threshold there. Yeah. Yes, I think, I mean, if you look at the bill, going back to its language, it says that the behaviour, the abusive behaviour, one of the list, has to cause physical or psychological harm. Now, if you just read that simply, that sounds like a pretty substantial test. But if you go into the definition of what psychological harm means, it includes the characteristic traditional criminal definitions of fear, alarm, and distress. And it strikes me that distress is not used in other comparable public order statutes that we've seen, but also distress is a fairly low bar for criminalization. It's be quite easy, perhaps, to cause somebody distress. To cause someone fear and alarm seems to me categorically different. Again, though, the language of distress, as I've kept mentioning in the English legislation, is there, but it's qualified by serious uh, fear or distress. So we're talking again about a threshold of seriousness. I mean, if you told me that I looked fat, chances are I might be moderately distressed by that, not to trivialise the matters, but that is a distressing thing. Distress seems a low bar, and if this bill is about the kind of really serious cases we're talking about, which really do undermine people in their human integrity, with their partnerships. It seems to me unnecessary to incorporate such a, a minimal threshold uh, into the bill. If we're really talking about catching these cases which deserve to be criminalised and are not criminalised at present, I think distress merely drags in a whole set of behaviours, given the broad definition of abuse, 
which may well impact on the credibility of this legislation and cast its net far, far too broadly. A very problematic thing, I'd argue, in a statute which has a maximum penalty of 14 years in prison. So, for example, if I were to refer to you as Mr. Tickle, as I did to begin with, that causes might... profound distress. <laughs> profound distress. <laughs> Maybe not such serious. One last yeah. aspect was the psychological abuse and the reasonable person uh, test. And I think there was some concern that would the reasonable person be able to recognise or identify what was psy psychological um, abuse? Would it need expert witnesses? I think, I think we were of the view that there could be a situation arising where the only way of establishing psychological impact would be from uh, calling an expert witness to, to speak to that, particularly in a situation where um, the complainer may not be supportive of the prosecution. Um, it would be hard to envisage a situation where the complainer doesn't give evidence, but the court could have established uh, psychological distress in, in the absence of that evidence. Um, Though perhaps, I mean, again, it goes back to the wider definition. Actually, you don't need to be an expert to recognise fear, alarm and distress in that context. So perhaps that might weigh against uh, the requirement to have expert witnesses. I mean, in many breach of the peace type cases, you don't have expert witnesses explaining to sheriffs or to juries what fear and alarm uh, looks like. So in the sense, you do use a lay definition, if you like, of, of, of the distress that's likely to be caused to the complainer here. Uh, there was just one last aspect of um, procedure, and that was in the bill that the, um, the accused shouldn't be allowed to defend, well, to, to do his own cross-examination and defend himself. I think the Advocates was very much in support of that, that there's a, um, a mirroring of the, the provisions that we have in respect of sexual offence trials, where the perpetrator is not allowed to conduct their own um, defence. The reason being, of course, um, so that, that there isn't an opportunity for further abuse or further distress to the complainer. Um, so we felt that was a very sensible move. And did everyone concur with that? Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, that concludes our... Uh, Liam? <laughs> just Sorry, can we just to follow up on that? that? There was, I think, a concern that where um, an individual who was unable to carry out their, their own cross-examination um, of a reasonably high worth but unwilling to instruct a solicitor that this may apply pressure on legal aid budgets. Is that is that right? The, uh, the Law Society, that, it was just, I suppose, something that you would have to be alert to, that if someone did, if the main aim of wanting to carry out... I have to say our, our initial response as criminal lawyers was that we really didn't come across that situation happening very often, certainly in so many cases, people saying I want to represent myself. But if that were to happen, I could see where it would cause distress. Uh, but we felt that it was appropriate to at least raise the issue that if someone was manipulative enough that they wished to carry out their own cross-examination in a court setting to make life a misery for the person um, <laughs> that they clearly wish to exert power over, as it were, then one way of doing that, obviously, would be to um, cross-examine themselves. If you wish to eliminate that, and people are quite calculating by nature, then another way of subverting the system would be to refuse to engage a solicitor. And then there would be a provision would have to be invoked where the court would have to appoint a solicitor for that person. And um, realistically, there's the, the, the possibility that by doing so, they can have legal representation free of charge. So that was just a point that we wanted to raise as, as just a practical matter, mm -hmm. that somebody could subvert the system in a different way by basically getting a free lawyer to do their trial for them. Had, had you worked that through to the extent that you felt that there might be a possible workaround, or is the workaround to that then going to cause, other pro going to cause more serious problems in other areas? I think it would need to be looked into. I, I'm not sure that there's a real risk um, of it happening, but it may happen. There is a provision already in existence where there can be court-appointed lawyers in sexual offence cases where someone refuses to engage a solicitor, or more commonly has sacked his solicitor as a way perhaps of creating more mayhem in the system. Um, I'm not sure how often it works. I, I don't know how often it is used, and I don't know how successful it is in its current setting. So I, I couldn't really see, and the committee couldn't really see what impact it might have in this new setting. 
That now concludes our line of question. Can I thank you very much for all your evidence, which has been immensely helpful for the committee. We now suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses. Item 7 is consideration of the Railway Policing Scotland Bill at Stage 2 and I ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. I welcome the Minister for Transport and the Islands and his officials. We'll move straight to the marshalled list and I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister in a group of its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 1. Thank you, Convener. This committee's Stage 1 report recommended that the new Section 85C, Subsection 1 of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 
inserted by section one of the bill be amended at stage two so that it is subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, this recommendation picks up on the conclusion of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in its own stage one report on, that, on the bill that this procedure should be amended. The procedure relates to the future regulations which are to specify which rail operators or classes of rail operator are covered by the requirement to enter into a railway policing agreement. Uh, the DPLRC's rationale for recommending changing the procedure is that it provides for a greater level of parliamentary scrutiny of those regulations. In correspondence with the DPLRC, we set out our view that the power to make these regulations is narrowly drawn and could only be used for the specified purposes. We also explained our view that applying the negative procedure to these regulations provided an appropriate balance between the need for parliamentary scrutiny and the effective use of parliamentary time and resource. However, as our written response to this committee's stage one report indicated, in the light of the views of both committees and the fact that these matters are always a balancing exercise, I am, of course, content to accept the recommendation. I am therefore bringing forward this amendment to change the procedure to the affirmative one. I move Amendment 1 in my name. Do members have any comments or questions? Ever. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The question is that Section 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 8, 9 and 14. Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, conveners. Colleagues will recall from the debate at stage one uh, recently, I have uh, concerns about both the content of the bill as well as the approach that's been taken uh, by the government. In relation to the latter, I do uh, think it was a mistake for ministers not to consult on more than a single option, that of merging BTP uh, with, uh, within Police Scotland. I recognise this was their preferred option. I understand that they would have perhaps found it difficult to persuade BTP officers, staff and the wider public that their willingness to properly consider uh, other options was uh, genuine. But to not bother asking for views uh, comes across as uh, blinkered, dogmatic and even a little arrogant. As a consequence, Parliament has been presented with a bill uh, that's not been properly road tested and has attracted con uh, uh, concerns and controversy and criticism from the majority of those who responded to the government's consultation as well as to this committee's call for uh, evidence. My amendments in this grouping, along with others that would inevitably have to be lodged ahead of stage three, uh, seek to explore an alternative option. Clearly this approach and indeed the timing is less than ideal, uh, but that I don't think is scarcely the, uh, the fault of myself or indeed of these uh, amendments. It certainly isn't the fault of the BTPA uh, who came forward with alternative proposals well before this bill was introduced uh, to Parliament. I, I believe we have the opportunity uh, to give this Parliament and Government uh, greater oversight of the British Transport Police functions uh, within Scotland, an opportunity that I think respects the commitments and recommendations of the Smith Commission uh, and an opportunity uh, that avoids many of the risks that this committee has heard arise directly as a result of the government's uh, hasty decision uh, to press ahead with full bone merger. And on that basis, I move Amendment 3 in my name. Yeah. Does any member wish to speak or comment? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, I hear the policy position that uh, Liam MacArthur uh, is expressing. I'm, I'm glad to see the Conservatives are now on the same side as the government, of course, as their manifesto uh, proposes to abolish the British Transport Police south of the border without providing it for any other options as well. But that's neither here nor there. The, 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 the real... No, he won't. You wouldn't take one from me last week. Um, I, I, I... Let me move to the substantial point that Liam makes. Um, I think uh, in, in particular uh, that his choice of amendments uh, is, is, is really uh, rather odd because the effect when you look at uh, what he's, he's, he's doing is to remove the oversight uh, of the British Transport Police Authority from the British Transport Police in Scotland fair enough, you can choose to do that, but does not put any alternative oversight into the, the bill as amended by his amendments. And that seems a rather odd way to progress the policy position that Liam MacArthur adopts. I don't accept his policy position, but if one does, um, I think the construction of what the, 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 there is here um, 
It, it also, of course, by leaving Section 1 in place, it creates this whole set of duties uh, in Section 1 for the Scottish Police Authority in relation to railway policing in Scotland, but without correspondingly creating any oversight from the Scottish Police Authority um, for railway policing. So it seems a rather curious set of amendments that just I, I just don't think in practical terms are constructed in a way to deliver the policy position that I believe that uh, Liam MacArthur is, is seeking to take. I, as I say, I have the more principal point that I disagree with his policy position as well. But if the policy position were to be accepted, I think these amendments do not serve it properly. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I am happy to support the amendments that um, Liam MacArthur has um, tabled today. The concerns that um, Mr MacArthur raised are the concerns that I have had throughout this, this bill process, that only um, one option was consulted on, no other options were considered, despite the fact that the British Transport Police Federation, um, in, in their paper, um, indicated that there were two other options that should, in my view, have been consulted on and, and discussed. Um, and, and I think not to do so is, is short-sighted and is a fundamental flaw in, in this legislation, and I am happy to support the amendments. Douglas? Uh, delighted that Stuart Stevenson is recognising a Conservative victory in this general election, and it's something uh, I'll make sure I, I repeat uh, as I go around uh, the area. Uh, and he will also know uh, quite clearly that what has been proposed uh, by the Conservative Party is quite different to what is proposed by the Scottish Nationalists here in Scotland. Uh, and I would speak to, uh, in support of the amendments by Liam MacArthur, and reiterate the points he has made uh, and I made during this, the Stage 1 debate which we held in the Chamber, that the government uh, only had one view on this. They did not consult with the public. It's perfectly understandable why they did not consult on more options, because when people responded to both the Scottish Government and indeed to this committee, there were a majority of people against and a majority of responses against the proposed merger of British Transport Police into Police Scotland. I think that was a clear message. It should be listened to by the government, and I would hope they would take cognizance of that uh, if these amendments are passed today. Rona, followed by John. Yes, yeah, thank you. I won't be supporting uh, Liam MacArthur's amendment today um, for some of the reasons that Stuart uh, Stevenson outlined. With regards to options, um, I think it's clear that the model that was chosen is the only one that makes it accountable to the people of Scotland. Um, Liam, no, no. Uh, Liam MacArthur's um, amendment also delays it till 2027. Um, and I don't think that's acceptable. And it effectively just rides a coaching horses through the whole bill, so I won't be, I won't be supporting it. John Finney. Um, I think the key point is one of oversight. Regardless of the model, and I accept that people uh, wanted different models, I don't know anyone who thought it was appropriate to have less oversight, and particularly at this, there's this juncture where we've, we've seen in recent times the, the, the absolute need to have, to have scrutiny. I, I won't be supporting this amendment. Um, George. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here as obviously a substitute, but I've managed to watch a lot of the things that have happened in the, coming up to the stage we're at now. And although Liam makes his points, and he makes it as eloquently as always, I won't be supporting them because I agree with everything that Stuart Stevenson said earlier on. But one of the things I really find quite bizarre in this whole scenario is that Douglas Ross is trying to defend the, the Tory party's uh, conversion to the Scottish Government's policy because the actual wording in their uh, manifesto is we will create a national infrastructure police force bringing together civil nuclear constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police to improve protection of critical infrastructure. Now, is that not just the case of they're looking at very similar position to the Scottish Government's looking at here. So that quite clearly tells us that the Westminster Government, but obviously if you're a Tory and you come over the border on a train, plane or a bus, you seem to change your mind just because the Scottish Government comes up with the idea. So I think uh, they need to have a look at themselves and let's look at the practicalities of what we're trying to achieve here, and that's having a police service that's actually fit for purpose. Right, if I could just add my comments. Um, 
There was one option and only one option um, consulted on. I think that was um, a great mistake. Uh, and therefore supporting uh, Liam MacArthur's um, amendment. And in relation to the point made by Stuart Stevenson, it merely reverts to the status quo. And we do have concurrent jurisdiction at present. Can I call on the Minister to respond, please? Thank you, and I thank uh, in particular Lee MacArthur for his explanation of the reasons <clears throat> he has brought these uh, amendments forward, and uh, they reflect much of what he said at the stage one uh, debate. Um, Convener Lee, Lee MacArthur and other members of the committee will be fully aware uh, of the Scottish Government's intention in bringing forward the railway policing bill. It is to make use of the powers over railway policing that are now devolved to this Parliament by integrating the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. Now, we've made that intention abundantly clear from the outset, but also it's been a long-standing policy position of this government for many years, uh, both before and indeed after our proposals to the Smith Commission uh, that railway policing powers should be devolved to this Scottish Parliament and that BTP should be integrated uh, to Police Scotland. Um, notwithstanding that, let me not take away from Liam MacArthur's uh, concerns uh, and where they are constructive, of course, uh, the government will always reflect upon them. Uh, but what Amendments 3 and 8 proposed here by Lee MacArthur would do is to leave the Scottish Police Authority with the power to enter into railway policing agreements with railway operators under which Police Scotland police the railways and railway property in Scotland, but without Police Scotland having all the powers needed to carry out that policing on a routine basis. There would equally be no duty on the Chief Constable of Police Scotland to ensure that policing of the railways was carried out in accordance with these agreements. Amendment 9, meantime, would retain the policing functions of the BTP in Scotland, but as Stuart Stevenson eloquently said, the governance duties of the BTP authority would no longer exist. If the intention underlying that amendment is that the BTP should continue to police the railways and railway property in Scotland, it is not clear to me how that is to be reconciled with the lack of any governance and accountability relationship between the Scottish Police Authority and the BTP. It is equally unclear how funding for the BTP's policing of the railways in Scotland would be secured since Section 2 of the Bill continues to permit the SPA to enter into railway policing agreements in respect of Police Scotland only. If the objective here is that the BTP should police the railways in Scotland and be accountable to the Scottish Police Authority and this Parliament for that, while also policing the railways in England and Wales with accountability to the BTPA and the UK Parliament for that, then my clear and previously expressed view is that this would prove complex and confusing for all those concerned. It's hard to see how Scotland's interests and indeed geography will receive the attention they deserve within a framework which will inev inevitably uh, remain dominated by the complex need of railway policing in London and the southeast of England. How that accountability might work is also far from clear. The legislative basis for it would need to be established. Liam MacArthur's proposed amendments do not set that out. However, if, even if they did, for the reasons I've just given, uh, we do not think that that would be a satisfactory solution. But putting all of that aside, Lee MacArthur will, of course, uh, be aware of, as other members have mentioned, the manifesto commitment that the Conservative Party, both the UK and the Scottish Conservatives, have in their manifesto, and that is to, and I quote, to create a national infrastructure police force bringing together civil nuclear constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police to improve the protection of critical infrastructure such as nuclear sites, railways and the strategic road network, end quote. If the Conservatives do win in the election and they do have their way, there will no longer be a British Transport Police. We would have to wait to see exactly what form this new national infrastructure force will take. I do not expect this parliament is likely to have any influence over that, but we would of course be keenly await news if we were depending on it to police Scotland's railways. I am not also aware whether or not that has gone out to public consultation or indeed whether other options were considered. But from what we do know, I hope I can persuade Lee MacArthur that rejecting the opportunity to have a railway policing function within Police Scotland that is fully accountable to the people of Scotland and the Scottish Parliament uh, would not uh, be a good use of powers over railway policing that have been devolved. The alternative before us, if, it, if a UK Conservative government is returned, would appear to have railway policing in Scotland integrated with the policing uh, of the strategic road network of England and Wales, but not with that of Scotland, and integrated not with the policing of the whole of Scotland transport infrastructure, the ports, roads uh, and airports, but instead with the policing of nuclear sites. It also appears from various press reports that this National Infrastructure Police Force 
would be predominantly an armed force. That is what was in a recent article in the police oracle uh, that they have suggested that. I would invite Lee MacArthur, of course, to reflect on whether uh, that is the path that he wishes to go down. So I ask Lee MacArthur not to press these amendments, but if they are pressed, I urge the committee to reject them for the reasons I've set forth. So to wind up, press or withdraw. Thanks very much, uh, Communi. Can I thank everybody for their uh, contributions, and, and in particular, um, Douglas, yourself, uh, Communi, and Mary, for um, the, uh, the support for these uh, amendments. And I recognise that the concerns I was expressing at the outset are ones that have been shared uh, by some colleagues on the, the committee. Um, can I also thank those for, uh, who, who may not feel able to support them, uh, either because of the principle or the way in which the amendments were, were lodged for the way in which they conveyed their concerns. Um, I think in relation to the, the comments from Stuart Stevenson, which set the tone for um, the comments made by, by others, um, I would, I think, fully accept that, uh, as I did in my earlier remarks, that the, uh, that the timing and the approach uh, were not necessarily of my choosing, uh, but an attempt, even at this late stage, to try and fashion a way um, to, to, uh, to, to road test an alternative uh, approach, which uh, the BTPA set out, as I say, in good time and could have been consulted upon. Um, I think in terms of the, the oversight, they made it perfectly clear that um, statutory oversight of um, BTP functions in, in Scotland was perfectly possible, uh, short of full merger within uh, Police Scotland. And I think, it, as I said before, it is regrettable that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't explored explicitly at the, at the time. Can I thank George Adam for referring to my comments as eloquent? I don't recall in however many years it was that we were on the Education <laughs> Committee that he ever said anything as nice about me. Uh, then. <laughs> I think once the whips find out what he said, uh, his stay on the Justice Committee may be time limited. Um, can I also thank the Minister um, for uh, his engagement with uh, me in relation to uh, the concerns I've uh, had about this bill um, from, the, from the outset and through, throughout. I do appreciate that. And I think even where we were hearing concerns from a range of stakeholders about what was being proposed, I think uh, it would be only fair to accept that um, there was also an acknowledgement of the willingness of the Minister to engage with them on, on those concerns. And I, I think um, I would wish to acknowledge that uh, as well. Nevertheless, um, I, I think we are where we are as a result of the government uh, approaching this on the basis of uh, there, is only, uh, there is only one option. I don't accept that and while uh, I do believe that um, there is a great deal more work that we need to be done ahead of stage three um, to address some of the concerns that have been raised about uh, the need for proper oversight of BTV functions in, in Scotland. Uh, nevertheless, I'm minded to, to uh, press ahead and move my amendment uh, number three. The question is that amendment three be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour? Those against? And no abstentions. Is that right? Okay, thank you. Any abstentions? No. Mm -hmm. As a result of the division, five are for and six six against, um, which means the amendment is not agreed. Uh, the question is therefore, all right, we don't need that. We can therefore move straight to amendment number four. I call amendment number four in the name of Douglas Law Ross, grouped with amendments five, six and seven. Douglas Ross to move amendment four and speak to all amendments in the group. No, we don't need to agree section two because we voted against the removal of section two. Okay, uh, Douglas Ross, to move and speak to all the amendments. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, members and indeed the minister will be very aware that during our discussions as a committee and indeed with numerous members uh, of the panel of witnesses, concern was raised over training of officers uh, should integration of British Transport Police within Police Scotland go ahead. And I think it's important at this stage that we remind ourselves of some of the quotes from our deliberations. I asked the rail operators about the personal track safety certificate and I said, how would you react if Police Scotland said that they were not going to put all officers through the training for personal track safety certificates. Neil Curtis of Direct Rail Services Limited said we would be concerned. Darren Horley of Virgin Trains said we would be very concerned. 
Moving on then to the panel of witnesses that we had with Nigel Goodbrand of the BTP. I said in asking the question, what implications will there be if officers in Scotland are not trained to the same level as BTP officers and they do not and they do not have the personal track safety certificate. Nigel Goodbrand said, every officer in Police Scotland who intends to police the railway or go anywhere near the railway will have to have a personal track safety certificate. Chief Superintendent McBride said, we go through personal safety training because from a health and safety point of view, it is necessary to protect our officers. He continued, that is why we do PTS, the benefits of flow from that are all geared to the public and to recovering operations as quickly when they have been brought to a stop by a criminal act or mental health episode. And Michael Hogg of the RMT union said um, that about officers, they are properly trained and having staff with a personal track safety certificate is crucial. He continued, anything else is pure nonsense as far as we are concerned. I think it would be pure nonsense for us as a committee not to include very clearly that we expect all officers in Police Scotland who, should this merger go ahead, will have an opportunity either as dedicated BTP officers within Police Scotland or as officers who could be, at the request of the Chief Constable and others, moved to railway policing. Uh, they should and must all have a personal track safety certificate. Uh, the further amendments which I have lodged also um, stipulate and request that the Scottish Government bring forward uh, information to this Parliament for scrutiny on the cost of training. That was very much an issue raised by um, Dr Murray in her paper as well. And I think the amendments that I am moving today uh, add to the deliberations and the discussions we have had as a committee. And should this legislation go through, I think they are vital to ensure that both our officers and the public that they serve are adequately protected should they be policing on our railways. And I uh, move the amendments in my name. Uh Amendment number six is in my main, so I now will speak to that amendment and the other amendments in the group. Um, further to Douglas Rossi's amendments that provide for the requirement of training for the Police Scotland officers and a report on the cost of this training, Amendment 6 and 7, which complement Amendments 4 and 5, by seeking to ensure that no officer can enter railway property without a PTS certificate having been obtained. At stage one of the committee, um, at stage one, the committee heard evidence from the British Transport Police Federation to the effect that every police, uh, every officer in Police Scotland who intends to police the railways or go anywhere near the railway will have to have a personal track safety certificate. The National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers (RMT) agreed and stated that stated the following. Police Scotland would not have access to our railways if there was a derailment or a collision or any trespass on a railway. If Police Scotland officers do not have a PTS certificate, they cannot go on or near the running line. The rail operator, operators all concurred with these statements. The Stage 1 reports notes that the committee wrote to Police Scotland for clarification on the nature and type of training that it intends to provide to all police officers post-integration and on whether all officers are to undertake personal track safety certificate training. In his response, Assistant Chief Constable Higgins explained that Police Scotland's training curriculum for new recruits at SPS, the Scottish Police College, is currently under review. Amendment 6, six therefore, clearly sets out the requirement for personal track safety training for police constables, and Amendment 7 ensures that this training is to the same standards as attained by BTP officers by requiring that regulations specifying the level of training have been made in consultation with the Office of Rail and Road Network, Rail, who specify the current level of training for the BTP. These amendments will therefore ensure that police officers operating in the railways will undertake personal track safety training to the level that BTP officers are required to obtain, attain. Right. Do members have any comments or questions on these um, amendments? Stuart Stevenson, followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, I want to just firstly engage in uh, the construction uh, of the amendments. 
And perhaps I'll uh, address uh, Amendment 6 in your name, convener, in the first instance. Um, and before doing so, I'll just agree uh, with the court, because we could hardly disagree with it, that Douglas Ross used every officer who intends to police the railway should need a track uh, safety certificate. But we need to be cautious about what that actually means. And the Amendment uh, 6 says, a constable must not enter railway property unless that person has completed track safety training. Well, the question, of course, is what is a railway property? And... Uh, I've only given part of the court, and I accept that. But, well, I invite you to complete the bit that you think I missed that matters. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for giving way, because I did give the full quote, and it says, every officer in Police Scotland who intends to police the railway or go anywhere near the railway will have to have a personal track safety certificate. I, I accept that, but, but you will find that that will merely reinforce the point I'm about to make which is, what is the definition of railway property? And the definition of railway property in the bill at 85M1 provides a list. That list specifically includes a station and a train used on a network. So without a track safety certificate, a police constable cannot enter a station, which I'm perfectly entitled to walk into any time I choose to do so without my having a track safety certificate. Furthermore, I can enter and use a train without having a track safety certificate, but the amendment would prohibit a constable being able to exercise that same right. Now, there is further reference at 85M3 uh, to the definition of railway property in the Railways Act 1993. And at section 83 of that act, it states, station means any land or other property which consists of premises used as or for the purposes of or otherwise in connection with a railway passenger station or railway passenger terminal, including any approaches, forecourt, cycle store or car park, whether or not the land or other property is or the premises are also used for other purposes. So therefore, a police constable, and a police constable is a constable whether on duty or not, would be prohibited from cycling to a police station, putting their bicycle in the car park, because that would be prohibited, purchasing a ticket in the station booking office, because he's not permitted to be there without a track safety certificate, would not be permitted to then use a train to travel to another destination. Now, it actually goes further than that. There are already circumstances where police constables, uh, as part of uh, the Scottish police, do enter the tracks without track safety certificates that would be prohibited by this. For example, uh, in the outskirts of Inverness, uh, to the east of Inverness, there is a level crossing. Police, in hot pursuit of a criminal fleeing an act of criminality, would, without a track safety certificate, be unable to progress across that level crossing onto the railway to pursue a criminal if this particular uh, amendment were to be passed. Uh, so I think in terms of the construct of what is trying to give effect to the policy position uh, that's being espoused here, uh, it is not a construct uh, that, that works uh, at any uh, practical level. Now, Turning to uh, the, the lead amendment here, uh, which is Amendment 4, in the name of Douglas Ross, um, the this, this specific point really is, who, who is it that needs to have track safety training? Now, we've already seen in the last week, for example, Waverley Station, uh, Police Scotland supplementing the British Transport Police and being on patrol uh, in the concourse of Waverley Station without track safety certificates. So we can see the, 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 quite properly the collaboration that there is. But the real point is, who is it that should determine what training uh, particular constables require for particular tasks? And I don't think it's the duty of us in the Parliament here, or for that matter, the Minister. It is an operational matter for the Chief Constable to determine. It's entirely proper 
that as part of the initial training of constables, that there should be reference to the duties that Police Scotland will, if this bill is passed, exercise in relation to railway policing, and they should be familiar uh, with uh, the constraints on a constable's proper actions. Don't act. In another, it's the same with uh, armed police. If a policeman who is not qualified to be an armed police is standing adjacent to an armed policeman who falls over and drops their gun, bluntly, I'm even dubious that that person should pick the gun up because they don't know about handling guns. Um, the same here is the case, that uh, it's only people who are properly trained should engage with the dangers that are specific to the environment of railway policing. Uh, but what is said in Douglas Ross' amendment uh, comes to a very different uh, conclusion. Now, um, looking at uh, the Amendment 5, which essentially uh, is, is a follow-on to Amendment 4. If Amendment 4 falls, then I, I have no particular objection to annual reports to ministers and to, to Parliament about what's going on in the police force. And indeed, if training is necessary, uh, is part of that, then that's, uh, uh, that's well and good. But I think when we look at the whole issue around uh, the, the, the limiting of who can have access to the stations, what's before us simply doesn't serve the policy purpose uh, that's intended and appears to be almost deliberately uh, to make it impossible for Police Scotland to continue to discharge duties which it currently discharges without any reported uh, difficulties in relation to certain aspects of what is currently defined and would in future be defined as railway property. Thank you. I would align myself on much of what uh, Stuart Stevens says about the forensic implications of, of, of should this motion go ahead. I want to talk of my uh, particular police experience. I was a police dog handler. I was involved in mountain search and rescue, and that involved me being conveyed and indeed winching in and out of helicopters. Um, these were both uh, well, uh, um, RAF and uh, Royal Navy helicopters, also civilian helicopters. I conveyed my dog in a fixed wing um, a, uh, service, uh, passenger service. Um, um, in the course of that, I had to carry pyrotechnics, which have their own issues. Um, my dog was conveyed in a motor launch on occasion, on one occasion a skidoo. Um, a, I had to deal with firearms, albeit deactivated as a as part of training. I also had a, a second dog who was an explosive detection dog. I had to handle a variety of uh, types of explosives. Colleagues with drugs dogs had a variety of drugs that they dealt with. When I became a, a Police Federation official, I became aware of the, the role of vehicle examiners and the evolving situation that we had to be aware of, for instance, uh, about the corrosive effect of brake fluid when vehicles were being examined and all these things were put in place. The point is that health and safety, in particular legislation, applies to all of that. This legislation is not about micromanaging the police, and this is not things that, in my mind, should be on the face of the ball. I won't be supporting the amendments. Neil MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. I think um, Douglas Ross very fairly um, set out uh, a number of the concerns that we explicitly uh, heard uh, through the course of the Stage 1 uh, evidence around um, the training that those uh, accessing the, the railways and uh, railway properties would, uh, would have. I think that was reflected in the uh, findings of the, the committee uh, report. And, uh, in a sense, uh, we heard reassurances from Police Scotland that uh, a training assessment would be uh, undertaken, and, and with no reason to, to doubt that. But to some extent, that rather um, reinforces the, uh, the, the point about um, the, the rather rush nature of this legislation, perhaps even underpins uh, uh, some of the argument for the amendments I have in a later, uh, in a later uh, grouping. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think whether or not the specific amendments that have been lodged in this grouping give effect precisely to, to the, the concerns that the uh, committee acknowledged and reflected in our stage one report, um, I, I'll be interested to hear the, the minister's response shortly. But I'm certainly supportive of, of um, uh, toughening up the language within the bill around this issue because it was pretty much a central concern right through the evidence we heard at stage one. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I can't add to anything that Stuart said because all, all points were covered. Um, and and um, 
as to what you know John said about I agree that well I, I think that this these amendments are far too restrictive and specific and frankly unworkable and um, also this this is a police operational matter I don't think it's um, responsibility of the government it's responsibility of the, the chief constable um, so I for those reasons and others I won't be supporting these amendments Mary Fee Thank you, um, Convener. Liam MacArthur has more than adequately expressed a lot of the, um, the sentiments that, that, that I was going to, um, to bring up. Um, I, I am minded to support um, Douglas Ross in his amendments regarding training. And I think it is worthwhile reminding ourselves that during the evidence, um, we heard um, concerns around the dilution of well-skilled professional railway um, staff with losing the, the specialism. Every rail union in the country was opposed to this bill. Um, the RMT, when they came to give us evidence, um, warned that they could take industrial action if the bill were to go ahead, citing concerns about the safety of the workforce and of the travelling public. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves of that um, today when we consider these uh, amendments. Um, and I think if this legislation goes ahead, that it needs to be far more prescriptive and detailed about the minimum level of training that um, officers within the BTP would be required to have and also um, how much refresher training um, they would need to have. I share some of the concerns that um, Stuart Stevenson expressed in relation to um, Amendment 6, um, simply because of the, the use of the word property, railway property. Um, and if the, the amendment were it to be passed, if it would mean that an officer could not enter a railway station, for example, um, I would be unable to support that one. But I'm happy to support the amendments around training. I call uh, on the Minister to respond. Thank you, uh, Convener. All of the amendments here, as members have said, seek to dictate to the Chief Constable of Peace Scotland the nature and the level of training that officers working in a specific area of operational policing should have. We are not aware of any precedent for Parliament prescribing requirements on the Chief Constable in this way. The Scottish Government cannot support it. The Chief Constable is responsible for operational policing. His responsibilities include ensuring that officers across Police Scotland have the specialist training they need to carry out their duties, and that is continually kept under review to, re to meet operational requirements. Neither the Scottish Parliament nor the Scottish Government should seek to intervene in the business of operational policing by dictating a fixed set of training requirements for railway police officers. Uh, we do not prescribe what firearms qualifications, driving qualifications, and the many other qualifications listed by John Finney and his contribution uh, that they should have. Uh, those are rightly operational policing matters. Neither should we be constraining specialist railway police in that way. Furthermore, the government's view is that both sets of amendments have misunderstood the information Police Scotland has provided the committee on the different levels of railway policing training that they propose to provide to officers in different parts of Police Scotland, which reflect different operational needs. Uh, committee members will, of course, be able to see for themselves from the letter Police Scotland provided last week to the committee in response to its stage one report, that it is not Police Scotland's intention for Police Scotland to provide all of its 17,000 officers, 17,000 plus officers, with a personal track safety certificate. Uh, that will be for the officers who work within the railway policing specialism in similar numbers to that provided currently to BTP officers in Scotland. If members choose to move these amendments, they will be seeking to override the professional view of Police Scotland. Police Scotland's recent letter also makes clear that it has clear operating procedures which are currently under review in conjunction with the BTP, stating that its police officers should not go onto the tracks when they attend an incident related to the railway. Should there be a requirement to do so, then a nationally agreed process demands that a competent and trained member of the rail industry is present at the scene to advise. Police Scotland is currently working with the BTP on a training needs analysis, as has been mentioned, and we should allow that work to continue. If Amendment 4 from Douglas Ross were to be passed, we would be faced with the substantial cost of providing personal track safety certificates to around 17,000 officers who would not have an operational requirement for one. If Amendment 6 and 7 from Margaret Mitchell were to be passed, a police officer who did not have that certificate would be unable to exercise the power of entry to railway property, as Stuart Stevenson mentioned in his contribution, even if that was to access an area nowhere near the actual track. 
uh, a locked station building, for example, or indeed a railway station or a train, we would be, as has been mentioned already, in the ludicrous position where you and I could go into a station or a train, but that a police constable could not if they did not have this certification. I'm sure no, no, no one of us would want to be in those positions. While Amendment 5 is dependent on Amendment 4, Amendment 5 is not one I can support on its own terms either. The amendment requires separate training plans and costs to be published. The bill already places a statutory requirement on the Scottish Police Authority to engage uh, on service performance and costs within the railway industry and others. The SPA will, of course, be accountable for that engagement, as on other matters, to this Parliament. In fact, this committee already has the power to scrutinise, to question the annual reports and accounts laid by the SPA, and has the option to seek further details on the training and costs of railway policing by Police Scotland at any time. Now, in summary, convener, the Scottish Government strongly opposes these amendments, which would impinge on the role of the Chief Constable in determining the training required to support operational policing. I therefore, of course, would ask Douglas Ross and Margaret Mitchell not to press the amendments, but if they are pressed, of course, ask the committee to reject them. This lost to wind up, press or withdraw. Thank you very much, Convener. And can I thank all members uh, on different sides for their contributions to the debate on these amendments? Uh, Stuart Stevenson uh, went to great length to describe the potential effects of uh, both uh, the amendments I put forward and indeed yourself, Convener. And I now feel I should blatantly declare an interest because, based on what Stuart Stevenson said, uh, my wife may not, as a police sergeant, be able to cycle into Elgin train station to get onto a train in Elgin uh, to go anywhere else. Uh, so I do accept that there is some criticism about going into a railway property, but I don't believe that should take away from the general emphasis we are trying to uh, include with these amendments, that there must be more detail and more scrutiny within the legislation on training. And if I do decide to press and these amendments are agreed, I would give a, a, a full um, you know, assurance that when bringing these back at stage three, I would like to, to redefine that element of the, the property and entering into a property to ensure we don't end up with what would be a, a rather ludicrous situation uh, where my wife and 17,233 other officers uh, couldn't board a train anywhere in Scotland. However, um, I also noted, Mr. Stevenson said, uh, who is it who should be determining the training requirements? Uh, and he doesn't want it to be politicians. But I think it is important as politicians and as members of this committee, we voice the opinions and views that were shared by British Transport Police officers, British Transport Police Authority, uh, the rail users, the unions, and indeed the rail operators, all of whom had significant concerns about a lack of training in the detail of this bill in terms of the response from the Scottish Government. And I think we can be a voice for those concerns. And I, I will give way to the member. Um, I, I think what Douglas Ross is saying is reasonably constructive in the context of the debate we've had. And, and I will not uh, step back from being interested in training. I, I, I think, like all members, will be interested in training. I think the sole area of difference uh, is who should be responsible for setting it. I think, I think that is the top, bottom and middle of it. But I think we can make common cause in continuing to take an interest in training and to hold the Chief Constable and the Minister accountable for whether we consider the training is adequate or not. I do appreciate those remarks from Stuart Stevenson. If I can very briefly just finish off with a few of the other contributions. Uh, Liam MacArthur was right to mention that this was a central concern uh, that we as a committee and our witnesses had around scrutiny at stage one. And Mary Fee, I thought, was correct also to highlight the concerns. Uh, indeed, um, I think it was Michael Hogg who said that some of the unions would be prepared to take industrial action and we need much more detail, not just for the safety of our officers, which is paramount, but the safety of all rail users. I was very pleased to get the support of Mr Stevenson for Amendment 5 in my name and disappointed that for some reason the Minister would not be quite as supportive. However, to finish, I uh, quoted at the beginning uh, the RMT, British Transport Police and Rail Operators, and I think it would be... Um, correct to finish my quotes and finish my uh, proposals going forward with a quote from the Scottish Police Federation and Callum Steele told this committee and I'll read his quote I do not consider it feasible I find it incomprehensible that the service 
be it the British Transport Police in its current state, a hybrid or a transport service within Police Service of Scotland would put a police officer out to work in a railway line without their having the appropriate track safety requirements. The old adage, if you think health and safety is expensive, try an accident, would come bearing down on them at a hell of a rate of knots, and I would be at the front of the queue knocking lumps out of them for even suggesting that it should be done that way. I would hope in... I, I just want to finish... Um, uh, no, I just want to finish this. I would hope that in considering all the responses we had a, as a committee and indeed that final quote from the Police Federation that we do treat, as Stuart Stevenson said, training as an imperative part of this bill going forward uh, and I will move and press the amendments in my name. The question is that Mendon Ford be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. They're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. And are there any abstentions? No. Five, four, six against, which means the uh, amendment is not passed. I call amendment five in the name of Douglas Ross, already debated with amendment four, to move or not move. Um, the question is, Amendment 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour? Those against? And no abstentions. Right. 5, 4, 6 against. Um, the amendment is not carried. Um, I call amendment six in my name. Oh, right. Okay. All right. All right. Six. 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 Question, amendment six. Yeah. Question, uh, question six. Uh, call amendment six in my name, already debated, um, which I now move. Question is, are we all agreed? To amendment six. No. We're not agreed, uh, therefore there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against. Right. <coughs> Thank you. The debate is four, four, seven against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 7 in uh, my name, already debated with um, Amendment 4, uh, which I do not move. The question is, therefore, that I call Amendment 8 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 3, Liam MacArthur, to move or not move? On the basis of um, the 3 not passing, I don't move 8 or right. 9. Not move. Thank you. Um, we all agree then. So that's on to yeah. The amendment is not moved, therefore I put the question is that section 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. The question is that um, section 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. I call amendment 9 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with amendment 3. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The question is therefore for that um, section five be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. All right. I call amendment two in the name of John Finney and a group on its own. John Finney to move and speak to amendment two. Uh, uh, thank you, convener. Um, this, uh, the purpose of this amendment is to put in a statute of footing uh, um, the assurances offered verbally by ACC Higgins, and they were that any BTP officer who transfers into Police Scotland would continue to work on railway policing duties unless they themselves agree to move. Um, it does this by providing a protection to officers from BTP modelled on the Police and Fire Reform Act protection for officers transferring from the territorial forces into Police Scotland and indeed legislation that applied long before that with all previous amalgamations. And it sets out that an officer must not be assigned to duties that would require them to move away from the geographical area of their former force unless the, the, 
they consent to do this. That was the previous arrangement. With this proposal, the amendment is the restriction relates to railway policing rather than geographic location, and that would facilitate officers who are served within BT at the moment from moving from one area to another, but still within the railway policing. Um, and this would provide a greater level of assurance to officers who wish to continue their career within uh, railway policing, and it would indeed place Police Scotland's statement of intent uh, on a strategy of footing. So I move the amendment in my name, Convener. Do any members wish to speak? Liam. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I thank John Finney for lodging uh, the amendment. I, I think given the, the debate we've just had um, in relation to uh, an earlier grouping, I'm, I'm minded to um, recall a specific quote from the Minister that the Parliament and Government should not seek to intervene uh, in the discretion or de decision-making of the Chief Constable. Um, I think what John Finney has set out is uh, a, a fairly reasonable argument for where that discretion and that decision-making uh, should to some extent be being um, uh, circumscribed. I, I think the, the amendment, for the reasons that uh, John Finney sets out, is one that reflects uh, the, uh, the, the, the concerns that we have during stage one uh, and seems to me to be a pragmatic and a proportionate way of, uh, of addressing those and therefore I would support it. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I just had a wee technical point about the, the drafting which I suspect it would be for the Minister to perhaps comment on. Um, at uh, section three, I just want to be absolutely clear uh, that a constable of the British Transport Police who, who is, um, uh, is engaged in duties out with the service that police would be treated as being a constable of the police service of Scotland operating on service outside the BTP at the point of transfer, just so that there's no ambiguity. I think it would be just useful to get that in the record. I, I sort of agonised around this and concluded it was OK, but I would like to hear, unless John Finney wants to come in on my comment. Certainly, the, the precise intention is not to disadvantage anyone. So if they're afforded the protection, and formerly in previous legislation I dealt with, Regulation 19 was well known, it's to afford that protection albeit that someone may have temporarily been a secondment elsewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely supporting what, what's proposed. I think it's a proper thing. I'm just making a very narrow, tiny technical point to make sure that we put on the record the intention. That's all. And that's probably, as I say, for the Minister rather. Okay. Thank you, Convener. I am um, happy to support this amendment. I think it... Um, it, it will, as John Finney and Liam MacArthur said, give assurance to... Um, concerns that we heard while we were um, taking evidence on, on from BTP staff that would be transferring over. Um, it, it very clearly laying out in the legislation like this gives a very firm indication of the intent um, that they will be allowed to, to stay within BTP if, if that is what they wish to do. And I think it's a sensible way forward and I'm happy to support. I call the Minister to respond. Uh, convener, my view this makes a very constructive contribution. I thank John Finney for bringing it forward. ACC Higgins of Police Scotland gave an assurance to this committee um, that any member of BTP who transfers Police Scotland will respect their right to police the railway environment for the remainder of their career, and they will not be moved elsewhere until they vol unless they volunteer uh, for that. In response to concerns that railway police officers could be diverted to other duties following integration, ACC Higgins gave a clear assurance that they would not, uh, with the obvious exception of a, a crisis situation. I am conscious that those assurances uh, have not yet persuaded all of those who have concerns on either front. Some members uh, referred to uh, this in stage one uh, debate uh, as well, that BTP officers would be deployed to non-railway duties. Uh, John Finney's amendment clearly puts the position beyond any doubt. It provides a statutory guarantee that any constable who transfers from the BTP to Police Scotland will be able to continue their career within railway policing if they wish to do so. An intervention on that point? Yes. Very grateful to the Minister for, for taking an intervention. Um, I, as I said in my remarks, I, I'm fully supportive of what is you described, Minister, as a constructive approach to an issue that was raised with us. And you also, I think, fairly quoted ACC Higgins, who's offered similar assurances. But, but those assurances were given in, in response to concerns um, uh, that were being expressed by BTP, um, but could be um, seen as Parliament 
and government uh, uh, establishing um, uh, criteria around the, the operational freedom um, and decisions that the, uh, that, that the Chief Constable and uh, senior officers within Police Scotland take. How is that different from the, uh, the, the concerns that Douglas Ross was raising in the, uh, under the previous amendments uh, around training provisions? I think a couple of ways, and if you don't mind, I'll quote the member directly from the contribution he literally just made that said that he believes this amendment strikes the right balance of being both proportionate and pragmatic in that respect. So I would agree with the member's previous contribution. And I think the most important part of the amendment uh, of, of John Finney's is uh, section 2, subsection B, that um, a constable to whom this subsection applies must not be assigned duties that do not so relate unless it is necessary to meet a special demand and resources for policing. So it goes back to my point about a crisis situation. Uh, it's still allowing the Chief Constable to have that flexibility, but at the same time, as the member himself said, and his contribution strikes the right balance between being, as he described it, proportionate and yet pragmatic. Um, it also um, gives statutory force, uh, th th this, uh, this uh, amendment gives statutory force to the guarantee that the officers who transfer will not be diverted, as I say, to other duties while ensuring that flexibility exists uh, with, the, with the Chief Constable. In terms of the, the point made by, um, uh, by, by Stuart Stevenson, I would concur with John Finney's response to that, uh, that the intention is to ensure appropriate protection for, for anyone on secondment at the time of, of, of transfer. So it's helpful to put that um, on, the, uh, on, on the record. So I strongly welcome this amendment. I'm grateful for, to John Finney for seeking to provide a greater level of reassurance to BTP officers transferring to Police Scotland that they will have every opportunity to continue their career within railway policing. Now, in turn, I believe this amendment will help to secure that objective of ensuring the expertise of BT officers is very much retained within railway policing on integration with Police uh, Scotland. So convener of the Scottish Government supports this amendment and, of course, I would ask the committee to similarly support it too. We need to wind up. Press or withdraw. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to those who have spoken. I think the important thing I would like to say is, and I did mention the Police and Fire Reform Act, this is entirely consistent with previous legislation that related to the, uh, the, the number of amalgamations that took place in 1975. So it's, it's a consistent position across the various uh, decades, shall we say. Thank you. Press or withdraw. I, I'm pressing yeah. uh, The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'll agree. I called Amendment 10 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendments 11, 12 and 13. Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 10 and speak to all amendments in the group. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. As with the earlier grouping, um, I, uh, the, the amendments within uh, this section reflect concerns um, I, I set out during the, the recent Stage 1 debate. I think throughout the evidence we heard earlier in this year, we heard concerns about the impact this bill was likely to have on BTP officers and staff, on the availability of specialist expertise around the policing of our railways, uh, and even the ability of the railway operators to provide a safe and efficient service uh, to the travelling public. However, we also heard concerns about the ability of Police Scotland at this point in time uh, to accommodate yet more structural uh, change. Uh, this is an organisation that has not had its problems to seek over recent years. Audit Scotland has uh, highlighted uh, serious shortcomings in financial management within Police Scotland uh, and that many of the savings and efficiencies that were promised by ministers at the time of centralisation have not materialised. Even if the Policing 2026 strategy does finally enable Police Scotland to emerge from a period that has taken its toll on the morale of officers and staff, um, why, uh, I would ask, uh, are we adding to the challenges um, they are being asked to contend with uh, by layering on yet further uh, structural upheaval? If the government is intent on pressing ahead and if it secures the backing of Parliament, then I believe there is a strong case for delaying implementation of any provisions. My amendments propose a delay of 10 years, which would safeguard the interests of BTP employees and allow more time for changes uh, to be made that would allow the transfer in due course to be managed more smoothly and with less disruption. Uh, I accept that this is perhaps an arbitrary figure and I'm open to suggestions of what might constitute a more appropriate time frame for implementation, but I firmly believe that is in the interests of policing in Scotland, both on our railways but also more widely. If ministers roll back from the headlong rush to dismantle VTP, and more time would at least allow the ground to be better prepared, even if the direction of travel uh, remains the same. And I move Amendment 10 in my name. Okay. Douglas Ross to speak to Amendment 12 and other amendments in the group. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I think I've mentioned some of the points already, and indeed I'll go back to the quote from Stuart Stevenson about how important training is to this committee and indeed uh, the process of this bill. And I think it is important that we get um, uh, information up front uh, at the time on terms of um, uh, the uh, cost of training and indeed laid before Parliament showing that all constables and police cadets have received the necessary training to police the railways and railway property. That, that may be different now because my earlier amendment failed, but it is still important that we get um, the information on all training for police, uh, uh, police officers and uh, police cadets uh, and indeed um, where that funding comes from. So I would uh, continue with Amendment 12 and move yeah. that motion. Do any members wish to speak? Stuart sure, Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Camina. Um, Lee MacArthur talked about a headlong rush. I'm not quite sure I recognise that the context of uh, the 1st of April 2027, but there we are. Um, I, I would say if in, in, in broad terms, if one is going to set a date that far in the future, uh, it might be more appropriate to say something like no sooner than. Uh, but that's a very minor uh, picky point. Uh, the, 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 the real point uh, comes in, uh, in uh, Amendment 11, which I think uh, uh, fundamentally gets it uh, absolutely wrong because the future of the bill and lies really only two hands. And the responsibility uh, for what we're doing has to lie, first of all, in the Chief Constable, who has to be sure and give us confidence that he is prepared uh, to pick up the responsibilities that this bill, um, if passed by Parliament, would give him. And secondly, it's for us uh, to take the responsibility for how we vote at the end of the parliamentary process uh, for this bill uh, when we vote at, at, stage, uh, at stage three. Uh, the list of uh, people that uh, are in Amendment 11 uh, are a whole long list of people who will have no responsibility uh, for the consequences of any um, decisions that they might uh, choose to make. And it's entirely inappropriate to hand the veto uh, for how the policing of uh, railways is to people who have no uh, responsibility uh, for carrying it forward. So I simply can't support uh, uh, Amendment 11 uh, on that basis. Uh, Douglas Ross, in uh, talking about uh, Amendment uh, 12, uh, my, my, my real problem with it is simply the use of the word all in 2BA, that all constables and police cadets, because it comes back to uh, the issue that I've made before, that the training of uh, constables and indeed police cadets is a matter for the chief constable to make sure that uh, the training that uh, all constables and police cadets have is consistent with the duties to which they will be assigned. Um, and it's as simple as that, that I can't support uh, uh, Amendment 12. Finney. Yeah, I, I shan't be supporting amendments either. I, I just wanted to point out that in relation to 2B subparagraph A, that there's a very important category that would be missing from there where I'm supporting that, and that is police support staff, who of course play the valuable role of scenes of crime examiner. So uh, there's a deficiency there anyway, but regardless, I won't be supporting. Call the Minister to respond. Thank you, Convener. This is a complex set of competing amendments that the committee has been asked to consider. Here, I'm grateful to Liam MacArthur for his explanation for what uh, he is looking uh, to achieve with this. Uh, these are not amendments that the Scottish Government is able to support. Uh, in my remarks, I'll concentrate on Amendment 11 uh, from Liam MacArthur and Amendment 12 from Douglas Ross, uh, as those raise the most important points. Though I will also say something about the timescale time scales in response to Liam MacArthur's Amendment 10. Uh, I have welcomed the Justice Committee Stage 1 report. It has made a number of very constructive suggestions, and we have responded positively to those. This committee has also heard from many uh, members of the Joint Programme Board, the BTP, uh, the BTP Authority, Police Scotland, the SPA and the UK Government's Department for Transport about the detailed programme of implementation that is already underway and is being delivered through effective partnership working. Passage of the bill will enable that work to move on to a vital, uh, vital area such as secondary legislation to deliver our commitment to BTP officers and staff on their jobs, pay and pensions. It also encompasses detailed work on operational integration, 
led jointly by Police Scotland uh, and the BTP, including the arrangements for training, which uh, Douglas Ross uh, has focused on in his amendments. This committee has rightly shown great interest in the work of the Joint Programme Boards and a desire to scrutinise the wide range of preparations over the coming period ahead of integration of the BTP uh, in Scotland into Police Scotland by the target date of the 1st of April 2019. The committee has asked for six monthly progress reports on the Joint Programme Board's work. Uh, as I have said, I am happy to accept that recommendation and will ensure that the Scottish Government provides these reports on behalf of the Board. Those reports will enable the committee to assess progress across the full range of the Board's work and to consider evidence of how the recommendations set out are being followed through. That includes recommendations that the Board should broaden its engagement to include the railway industry and other key interests during the work ahead of it. Amendments 11 and 12 from Liam MacArthur and Douglas Ross go further than the committee's stage one report envisages and seeks to set out a statutory requirement for other reports in addition to that. Uh, in the case of Douglas Ross's amendment, uh, that would focus primarily on training. Uh, progress, progress reports from the Joint uh, Programme Board will, of course, provide the committee with much more than that. The Board's progress reports will provide regular updates on the readiness for integration. Uh, Lee MacArthur's amendment would create an additional hurdle uh, where, as Stuart Stevenson has said, a large number of different uh, bodies would all have an effective right of veto before integration can proceed. Uh, he will not be surprised uh, to know that I cannot support that proposal. While the Scottish Government will engage closely with a range of interests in considering the timing of commencement, we believe the Government must retain the responsibility for that decision. By taking that responsibility, the Government would, of course, be accountable to Parliament for the decisions that we are making. Lee MacArthur will also be unsurprised to hear that I am unable to support his amendment to delay commencement of the provision of the Bill until 2027. Uh, we would have very limited say about how railway policing in Scotland would be delivered in the meantime. Of course, we know that if the Conservatives are returned to power in Westminster, it would no longer be uh, by the BTP as it currently exists. This amendment would mean that we lose out on the benefits of integrated policing across Scotland's transport infrastructure for the lifetime of two parliaments. Uh, I ask Lee MacArthur and indeed Douglas Ross not to press these amendments, uh, but if they do press them, of course, I ask the committee to reject them. Lee MacArthur, twined up, press or withdraw. Okay, thanks, Kate. Committee, can I start with an apology to Douglas Ross that I didn't um, acknowledge his amendment in this grouping in my uh, earlier remarks, but just to put on record that as with his earlier amendments, I'm supportive of the emphasis they put on uh, the importance of training. In relation to Stuart Stevenson's uh, comments, and I thank him again for those, um, uh, when I referred to headlong rush, I was not, of course, levelling a criticism of myself, um, which, as he rightly says, in putting the date back to 1st of April 2027, um, I, I think I could not be accused of uh, anything like a headlong uh, rush. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the provisions um, or the recommendations within the uh, Smith Commission uh, re report uh, did somewhat come out of left field for the, for the BTP. Um, and the distance uh, we have travelled uh, between the Smith Commission report uh, and this bill coming forward is, is no great distance at all. Uh, and therefore, I think as far as many in the BTP are concerned, there has been a headlong rush, uh, particularly um, given that there is the absence of other options having been uh, consulted upon, although I do take his point uh, about perhaps uh, more felicitous, felicitous language um, no sooner than, and I will certainly bear that uh, in mind. Um, can I thank John Finney for his comments, although I think they were more directed at, at Douglas Ross's amendments than, than mine, but I acknowledge he is not supportive of uh, my amendments. Can I also acknowledge um, belatedly Rona Mackay, who I think revealed, let the cat out of the bag uh, about her, uh, her views on my amendments in this grouping in responding to the earlier grouping, uh, but I thank her for that. And in relation to what the Minister had to say, um, he's right to point to the, the partnership working. I think we had a, a, a good evidence session with um, representative of the JPB, and I think he very much um, said what uh, the, or, or reinforced what the minister uh, has said. Um, but in a sense, the, the, the proposal to merge BTP within Police Scotland was not at the request of Police Scotland. I think had we made a request to Police Scotland um, to give them more time, I'm not entirely sure that we would cast that back up in our face, given uh, the challenges that they have to take on board uh, at the moment. I think to give credit to Police Scotland, they tried to offer the uh, committee reassurances where they could, but nevertheless, I think the, uh, the, the structural upheaval that this, is, this will involve 
over and above the, uh, uh, the challenges they already have on their plate um, uh, should not be uh, underestimated. And I think um, a lot of the uh, evidence we heard around the concerns that BTP uh, officers and staff currently have about the maintenance of their terms and conditions um, is going to make it very difficult to provide reassurance on that side, while at the same time going through a difficult process with Police Scotland officers and staff um, through the context of the Policing 2026 um, strategy, uh, I will in a second, um, to 2026 strategy, uh, in that the more that's given in one area, the more difficult it will be to provide reassurance in the other. And I give way to John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member giving way. Uh, would the member accept that ACC Higgins described the time frame as being a luxury compared to the, the amalgamation of things? I'm grateful for John Finney's uh, comment, although I think um, ACC Higgins' uh, reference to a luxury um, only serves to underscore the other difficulties that ACC Higgins and his colleagues are trying to grapple with at the moment. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, suggest that by any uh, stretch of the imagination uh, it, it um, reflected enthusiasm on his part um, that uh, the workload that they are trying to deal with in terms of uh, this structural change is one that is particularly welcome. So on that basis, um, I uh, propose to move Amendment 10 in my Right, the question is that amendment 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. Those in favour? Those against? Okay, any abstentions? There are five for the motion, six against. The amendment is not passed. I call amendment 11 in the name of Liam MacArthur already debated with amendment 10. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Don't move, Alan. Not move, thank you. The question is then, oh, I call amendment um, 12 in the name of Douglas Ross already debated with amendment 10. Douglas Ross to move or not move? Uh, on the basis of previous uh, votes, I will not move the amendment. Thank you. Not moved. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 10. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Likewise, not moved. Not moved. Uh, the question is that Section 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 8 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 3. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The question is the long title be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Uh, agenda item number eight is a feedback. Oh, sorry, Minister, thank you very much. Um, we were trying to get through the amendments today rather than having to bring them back. Thank you very much for you and your officials for appealing. Agenda item number eight is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on its policing meeting of 24, 25th of May 2017. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments on questions. I refer members to paper seven, which is a note by the clerk, and invite Mary Fee to provide that feedback. Thank you, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 25th of May when it agreed and published its report on the governance of the Scottish Police Authority. The subcommittee shares the very serious concerns about the governance of the Scottish Police Authority, which were raised by the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. It wrote to the Cabinet Secretary of Justice with its views, and that letter was also copied to HMICS to assist Derek Penman in his urgent review of the openness and transparency of the Scottish Police Authority. The subcommittee will consider that report next month. The next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 1st of June, when it will take evidence from Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority on the Auditor General's 2015-16 audit of the Scottish Police Authority and its review of Police Scotland's I6 programme. And I am happy to take any questions. Members have any questions for me? There being no questions, that concludes the 20th meeting of 2017. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 6 June, when we will continue our evidence taking on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. Well done. <laughs> we got through it, didn't we?